it's not very neat. Oh, my. Is that just me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really not. I know, I know, I know. but it's still funny. <laughs> I've seen Taj touch it. I know. <laughs> if someone else wants to, that's fine, but I'm not touching the sound. <laughs> A minute here. Staff ready? Okay, it being after 6.30, I will call this meeting to order. Um, one of our directors is on the phone, which is right there, and otherwise we're all otherwise here. Uh, there's no... Roll call? Yeah, roll call. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Tom? Tom? Director LaHue? Yes. Okay. Director Jaffe? Yes, I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear her. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'm here. Director Christensen? Here. And President Daniels? And here. here too. Okay. No public hearing tonight. There was a closed session um, where we gave some direction to uh, our, uh, what, what, what do we ter term you? Our, our legal counsel or our District representative counsel. on the case? Or Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first thing up is the consent agenda. Are there any things that directors wish to have pulled for discussion? Oh yeah, I was gonna. I I just wanted to, just to ask a few questions about the, three point one two to three point one five. That's all. Three Say point, that again. Uh, three point one two to three point one five. Name the damages. And so three point two to three point five. Just pull those. Well, they're all together, but just one explanation is. The, the three of them. You mean three point one four. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. those. Yeah, they're all the same, but I just, they all seem related. So it's just. Three related to Huntington Drive. One right. explanation. Okay. I know. I don't get that all. I wish to pull uh, 317. Anyone in the public wish to talk about any of these items? Okay. Seeing none. Anyone want to make a motion for all the rest of them? I'll move. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? We have, to, we have to roll call on Aye. everything tonight. Aye. Oh, yes. Roll call so, for everything. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And Director or President Daniels? Yes. Okay, we're going to do 312, 313, 314. So 312, 313, and 314 are all to deny claims of damage at various. Uh, residences on Huntington Drive. The step next step would be to go ahead and refer them to our insurance company for resolution. But the reason we denied them is because what was being done was some work. I'm sorry to interrupt again. I can't hear whoever's speaking. Oh, can you hear me now? Taj, can you maybe do something? A little better. I'll speak really loudly. Um, so the reason that we denied those claims was we were working on a service abandonment on Huntington Drive, and um, it's kind of a routine maintenance, uh, routine operations. What happened is we did not shut off the water. Uh, we, there was a loss in water pressure, um, or we reduced water pressure in order to do the maintenance work. Because this is routine maintenance work, it happens at various mains all throughout the district. Mm -hmm. There's an expectation under um, Ordinance 13-01 that um, residences keep their service lines in good repair so that routine maintenance on our distribution system doesn't impact them unduly. And so it was just kind of a routine process to look at this and, and deny those claims and forward them to the insurance company for resolution. Any questions about that? Oh, no, I just, yeah, I didn't understand the, you know, 
it, how they were all related. So it's just uh, they. You're it was all the same incident, same incident when when water pressure was reduced. Yeah, those those particular homes are at a higher elevation than some of the others on the drive, mm -hmm. so that's probably why they were affected. Okay, you want to make the motion to approve those? Yes, three? I'll move to approve uh, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14. Uh, I'll second. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. Okay, I wanted to talk about 317, which is the uh, O'Neill Ranch well and the problem we've been having with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was the first question I had on that? Let me just jump over to that. Well, the, the, the one thing I was going to ask about is uh, we're talking about two separate possible things we're going to try to fix it. Again, shutting off various portions. Correct. And what is the time it's going to take us to do each of those? Is it one month, two months, three months, six years? Uh, so how, how long are we looking to see whether those two things, one of those two things works or not? Um, the past experiments that we've been doing with uh, shutting off certain screened intervals, the um, ammonia level steadily crept up over the time of a couple of months. So that's probably what we're expecting. If if it stabilizes within two months, then that's probably really good news. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully we wouldn't have to do the next phase. No. So, I mean, it's basically if the ammonia stabilizes or not. And in the past, it it's ramped up pretty quick in a couple of months. Okay. And how long to actually do the, uh, the shutting off? Is that weeks or months? Or? Oh, no, that's probably, uh, well, they need to pull the equipment and yes. then install some new equipment. So it's probably a couple of days of field work mm -hmm. for each, for each uh, phase. Uh -huh. And then we would have to do well disinfection and testing and then put it back online. So maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks? Or? Um, with disinfection and testing, uh, that's probably a couple of weeks right there, so maybe like a three-week process total. Okay. So that means uh, for five months approximately then before we would know whether that process had worked or not. Um, yeah, pro or, or a little less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Well, I'm wondering, since we've tried some of this before and not had much success and therefore that might say we don't really understand what's going on with that well because we thought, you know, the previous 2A pack was going to hopefully fix it, and it didn't. I'm wondering if we shouldn't start doing another work, piece of work, to see if we can filter the ammonia out, which is, I think, if we can't fiddle around with the well itself, that's kind of what we're going to be forced to do to fix this, I would expect, right? Right. If if well modification doesn't work, then the only option that we have come up with is to investigate feasibility of treating. Mm -hmm. So converting our current treatment process to a different treatment process. Um, hopefully we could reuse our filter vessels, um, but it, at this point we're not sure. Mm -hmm. We may have to introduce um, new treatment vessels. Right. And so that, I mean, that is a, a really large, expensive undertaking. So if we can fix the problem with just spending a relatively small, uh, smaller amount of money to modify the well, then that's what, you know, we're recommending doing, exhausting that before we move on to um, wellhead treatment because that's expensive and time consuming and. Well, I, I don't think we would need to install it right now, but I think we should know what our options are and what that's going to cost and who would be you know, kind of be ready to do that because this is a critical thing if we're going to do the uh, transfer project this winter. And if we, we spend five months with these and then say, okay, well, let's start looking at something else to do, um, we might well miss most of the winter flows. So I'm wondering well, if, if the, we well, yeah, if the well modification doesn't 
work, we're going to miss this winter. Period. Yeah. So you don't think we can? No. It sounds like we don't even have a, another solution other than we we need to do something else different. Well, I mean, the, we we're trying to we want to isolate the the water transfer zone before, um, during, and after the water transfer. So, um, I guess the question is whether or not we can supply enough water to that zone with O'Neill well off. Right. Um, and we have done some modeling and it um, under like the peak summer demand, it looks really difficult. Um, we might be able to get away with it um, if it's not peak demand. Um, okay. So, but right now Main Street well is off too, so that's definitely a no-go. Right, um, right. But we're hoping to get that one back online in time to start doing the pre-transfer monitoring. Um, so, but uh, looking at feasibility of rem uh, treatment is going <coughs> to be a long-term process anyway, but we have um, uh, received qualifications from, I think, three different firms. Mm -hmm. um, so if the board wants us to proceed with that, then we can um, go ahead and select a consultant and start the feasibility study. I think that would be a prudent thing to do myself. Um, we might not end up having to actually need it, but that way we we'll at least have a solution that we're ready to start going with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, we were planning for that, but we did not <coughs> include that in this year's budget because mm -hmm. we didn't want to commit some funds that maybe didn't need to be committed. Mm -hmm. So we would have to come back to, to the board and uh, allocate more money from OCR to right, initiate right, that right. work. Any idea of what the cost might be for that additional work? What, what I'm referring to is more of the design level work, I know, not I know. the mid level yes, work. Yes, but what would be the cost um, of that that work? I, I'm not going to, I can't answer that right now. But we haven't even gotten to that stage. We've basically gotten to the selection or the opportunity to look at three, three con, uh, consultants. Okay. Well, I for one would like to see you come back with some idea then of, you know, what the options are and what the cost might be if we do have to go down that and time because uh, I would just as soon not miss this winter season and uh, if there's something we could be doing now to make that happen even if these other two things don't work then I think we should do some of those so depending on the cost of course oh, of course well but at least we should know what the cost is exactly yeah is that okay I got some ideas we can come Okay. Well, then I'll move approval of this. Is that? I'll second. There's one thing. Yes. <laughs> Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? I'm having an unpublic hearing, so entire motion that I need you to repeat, please, loudly. We just approved 317, as is. And direction was given to staff to look into what we might have to do if these don't work. Okay. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniel? Yes. Okay, now we move on to oral communications. So this is the time for everyone in the audience to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Microphone. Um, I know you know who I am, but I'm Jeff Stallings, 2771 Gary Drive. Do you know who this is? You do? I'm Ann Morse, 2776, Gary Drive. Mm -hmm. So I am your closest in depth. Longest name. Okay. Mm -hmm. The point is, we live at the end of Gary Drive, <coughs> right next to the other side of the fence from your maintenance mm -hmm. yard. For context, Ann and her husband Bill moved into their house four years before you built your headquarters building. Mm -hmm. So um, that gives, I, I, I think you should listen to what she has to say and what we have to say. Main thing we wanted to give you a heads up that we will be jointly submitting our comments to your draft EIR on, on Pure Water Soquel. Good. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. It'll be a fascinating reading, I'm sure. Uh, the second of three things is we had some legal advice to ask you if your ongoing operations and maintenance plan allows for the dust that settles on the Morks house more than mine every time you are using your gravel operation 
dust flies through the air, they've never complained. They're de depression era people, they don't complain. Um, but we've been advised that we, we, we want to find out if, if your operations and maintenance plan allows for this dust to, uh, and if so, if we could get a copy of that. Um, Bill's husband is 94 years old and in home hospice. This has always been a distressing problem for them, but it's even more so now. Um, the, the rusted chain link fence that separates your maintenance yard from our properties does nothing to alleviate the dust and noise uh, from your gravel operation or your steel plate operations, which I've brought up with your staff many times. So why is the steel plate operation 10 feet from our living room? And finally, we want to tell you that we support Pure Water Soquel in the Chanticleer site. I've been there five times. I had lunch in the Chanticleer site the other day, and I sat there and I was wondering why would you ever consider any site beside that site? It's surrounded by car repair shops, Highway 1. Melanie, I know you want uh, visibility for this project. You couldn't get more vi visibility than thousands of cars passing it every day. Um, we strongly support, uh, oppose the construction of Pure Water Soquel in um, our neighborhood with people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in a three-year construction project. Um, I know you're having the meeting next month, uh, but you don't allow people to get up and talk at that, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we contend that the district's deferred maintenance, you were notified by the U U.S. Geological Survey in 1978, 40 years ago, about seawater intrusion. So to call it an emergency to take that property next to us and convert it from residential to industrial is not fair. Hey, hey, I did it. <laughs> anyway, you'll be happy to know we're leaving. Ann needs to get home to Bill. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And please do submit com comments. We really do want that to happen. Okay, anyone else? Okay, see none. Uh, any director comments? Me. There's a couple of things I was going to mention. Um, uh, Carla and I met with uh, some residents uh, at Pete's uh, Coffee in Capitola on Bay Avenue uh, this uh, past week, and uh, that was good. We had about seven or eight people show up, and uh, most of them were district customers, and that was even better than the last time I was there, so <laughs> that was good. Um, and I was also going to mention that the uh, uh, Cameron is planning on getting together the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee for the Groundwater Model. Uh, first time it's happened in, well, well over a year, so I think it's, it's good that it's happening. I'm not quite sure what we're going to cover, but we're going to meet and go over some uh, groundwater model issues. So that's all I had to say. All right, so let's move on. 5.1, the board planning calendar. Yes, I'll point out a couple of things. Uh, we have a board workshop next Tuesday. It's noted in the calendar starting at 6 p.m. Uh, that may be adjusted uh, to five unless we um, get indication that a board member can't make that. Um, yes, and do you, you want to mention that? I can mention it. Go ahead. Just wanted to let you know that I did put uh, the material for that workshop um, at the dais for you. And I'm sorry. The material for that workshop has been given to each board member and also set on the back table, is what Melanie just said, for the, um, the workshop next Tuesday. Yes. Right. It, it would be difficult for me to make it at okay. five. Okay, so you want to keep it at six? All right, we'll just keep it at six. Uh, it may be a two, two-parter, but um, we'll, we'll keep it at six then. Then I also note, um, there's a couple uh, finance rate meetings on uh, Monday, July, I mean, Monday the 23rd and 30th of July. So since we won't be meeting again before then, I just want to get that on your radar for uh, the committee members who are on there. And then, of course, um, July 31st, ESA will be holding a, um, a meeting at Twin Lakes Church to uh, provide information and obtain comments on the draft EIR that's now out. Um, and let's see, um, our next normal board meeting will be August 21st, but the week before that, there are also three different, uh, three different committee uh, meetings and rate hearings. So just I wanna you know, pay attention to the calendar before um, a lot going on before the next regular board meeting. Okay, 
Any public questions about the calendar? Seeing none. Okay, then the next one would be 5.2, the special board assignments. Yeah, it's all in writing, Other, nothing special to note. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Any public questions? All right, so that goes to 5.3, quarterly organization-wide comprehensive report. Yes, and Alyssa's up uh, tonight uh, for Shelley. Um, she'll be speaking on this item and uh, one of the last items on the agenda. Hello. Um, so for our uh, portion of the status report, we, um, we only really wanted to point out one thing, and that was the legislation by the state, the AB 1668 and SB 606. So um, those are going to um, set some guidelines for indoor and outdoor water use. Um, one of the main provisions is to set the indoor um, water use to um, 55 gallons per capita daily. So we went ahead and looked at what our current um, indoor use is, and we um, expect that ours is going to be quite a bit lower. Our customers already conserve quite a bit. Um, and we haven't received any guidance yet on what the outdoor um, guidelines are going to be. So once we get those, we um, will let you know and report back. I think they're talking about a year from now, something like that. Yeah, it starts in 2020 and then um, eventually would ratchet down to 50 gallons per capita daily in 2030. And uh, we still think that we would meet that even now. So uh, we're not too worried about it. Um, but we'll definitely keep an eye on it and see um, how it fits into our demand forecasts. Mm -hmm. I noticed uh, I got an email from Aqua, and I think probably everyone else did, about the, a webinar that's available on discussing those two, uh, those two bills. Um, just yeah, that would be good to check out. Um, and I can also answer any other questions um, on the status report. I had one question on um, page 105, seeing the... Uh, Great to pick up we're doing with those low, low flow toilets. Um, have we been talking to the sewage department uh, lately of, in county about, uh, you know, as we go lower and lower and lower with water use, there could be an issue with flow in the sewers. And uh, have we talked with them to see, you know, is that We still okay? haven't. Okay. Um, but we can. Okay. That would be wise because that's a problem. We need to know about it before it happens. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Tom? Tom has one. I had a quick question um, on page 103 when I was talking about the water demand offset uh, and the retrofit on resale. I'm sorry, not water demand offset, but the retrofit on resale. It said Capitola revised their, their retrofit um, or ordinance to exclude areas of the city served by the district. Could you explain? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so from our understanding, um, the city of Capitola is not going to be enforcing the retrofit on sale ordinance um, in the areas that are served by our district. Um, the areas that are served by Santa Cruz water um, is still included under their ordinance, to my understanding. So the cap they're, they're deferring to the county to enforce it? Um, I'm not sure, but I can check. Mm -hmm. I would hate to lose that incentive completely. No, uh, it's not going to, my understanding, it's not going to be enforced, but what we've shown um, regarding the retrofit on resale, basically it's at diminishing, far beyond diminishing returns. It's, it's providing almost um, very little uh, return on the, on the effort. We've reached saturation. So the county's not doing Thank any you. any part of the district area then? Neither in Capitola nor elsewhere? So Kel, do you know? The, the county will be enforcing in um, the unincorporated areas. Just not in Capitola. Okay. So, all, right. all right. Thank you. Okay. Let's see what's next. Oops. 
I'll get started. Yeah. I don't have anything specific on our projects, but I did want to point out on page 113, we've never really talked about it um, at, the, at the board meetings, but uh, it's a list of services that are, you know, pending installation. Some of them may, you may not recognize, and I wanted to point out that those are, the ones that you may not recognize are the ones listed as fire service. Those don't come to the board, but they do come to our office and our department. We have to administer those. So we list them because it does impact our workload. It's not a WDO thing. It's usually just a, retro, a remodel that people need sprinklers on, but still has to go through a lot of motions with our department. Mm -hmm. Any okay. other questions, I can answer them. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Catch up here. O&M? O&M, right. Um, I don't have anything to add unless you have any questions I can answer. Any questions? Guess not, thank you. And we'll go to D, special projects. I don't have anything to add as well since I think everybody knows that our draft DIR is out. Um, we are accepting comments through August 13th and uh, our public meeting is July 31st. Any questions? Any finance uh, questions? None? Okay. Uh, human resources. I believe nothing there, so I'll All right. jump into it. I, I'll note two things. One is the uh, Cindy, City of San Diego, uh, their Pure Water Project. The In April, the uh, San Diego City Council unanimously certified their uh, environmental impact report and environmental impact statement for that project, and that project is treated wastewater effluent uh, for, uh, for potable use and uh, it decreases effluent going to the uh, Pacific Ocean. And then the other one um, I wanted to point out is, uh, next one, just go down a little bit here, yeah. is uh, the, the um, uh, Pacific Institute put out a report on stormwater uh, capture, and it's nothing super enlightening, but it's, it's solid information. It basically says they'd like to see entities do this more and also insta uh, the state uh, help promote it. So I know some of you up on there have a, a keen interest for stormwater capture, so we wanna make sure we point that out. That's it, okay. Any questions? So San Diego is direct potable reuse? How, how do they, they no. send it up to the reservoir? They, they go the, so it's called indirect. It's called indirect. So they purify it, send it up to the reservoir with mixing, and then it, it, it comes they back treat down. Treated again. Treated again. And that was just approved by the state this year. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's, it's, it's not being in, re recharged then. Not direct. No. Well, no, not directly. It's, it's, it's still an indirect because it becomes a, a new potable source: surface water versus groundwater. Yeah. But not flange to flange direct. Gotcha. Any public comment on this uh, report we just went through? So none. Okay, the MGA report, 5.4. Yeah, so I'll just point out that there's a joint meeting Thursday night, this coming Thursday, for, at Simpkin Center from 6.30 to 9 p.m. And it's a joint meeting actually between the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee and the Mid-County Groundwater Agency Board itself. So two entities coming together for a couple hour presentation. Um, besides a few business items, is really focusing on uh, projects that are being considered in this region to uh, help the overdraft situation and seawater intrusion. The, the way it's set up is uh, John Ricker will give a brief in, uh, intro on to what we've been trying to do for the last 30 years, so a little history of uh, unsuccessful water development in this area. And then I'll give a presentation on what the district's up to with its community water plan, and then uh, Rosemary Menard for the city will come in and talk about what the city's been up to. So, and then there will also be opportunity for some members of the public to present too. Any comments or questions on that? Public? No? District Council oral report. Yes, um, SB 831, which is the revised ADU bill, has apparently died in committee. 
it was referred to the government committee. They had a hearing and then didn't hold a vote. And it appears like it's gone for at least this year. Um, the Great Oaks case, which was at the Supreme Court at the same time as the City of Buena Ventura case, has now been sent by the Supreme Court back to the Sixth District Court to render a new decision. So we're expecting that sometime, maybe towards the end of summer. Um, and the Goleta case, which directly attacks tiered rates, is now fully briefed and argued, so we should get a decision within 90 days. Any public comment? All right, let's move to 6.1, the will serve letters. We have two of them. Yeah, so the first one is uh, a, a new accessory dwelling unit in Aptos. And um, we can take them individually or, or not. I'll, I'll also mention that uh, the other applicant for 6.1.2 is in the audience. Uh, AJ is with us tonight. He owns the sh both Chevron stations, one on Bay Avenue and one on Soquel near, near uh, Park Avenue. Uh, he's proposing to put in a new car wash down on Bay Avenue at that Chevron station. So you're more than welcome to address the board if you wish or ask any questions. We can try our, our best to answer them. It's nice to see it's using recycled water. Yeah. Any questions or comments on these? Uh, no, just that I think uh, you know, that gives more people an alternative to using the hose at their house to wash their car instead of recycling most of it. So hopefully overall it saves water. Yeah. Any public comment on this item? Any board actions here? I'll make the motions. Both of them? Both and I'll them. second them. Okay. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. President Daniels? No. That passes. Um, 6.2, presentation of surface water purchase pilot project. Bench scale test. We'll do a quick switch out. Good evening, audience and board members. Uh, we tonight, uh, part of your packet is our several slides as well as a final draft of the technical memorandum prepared by Black and Veatch uh, in, in looking at how the city's surface water um, can blend with our groundwater. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Sarah Perez and Heidi Luckenbach with the city of Santa Cruz. Um, they're here and they've also been instrumental as working together to, to go through this process and they'll continue to work with us uh, going forward because one thing I want to make sure that everyone understands is uh, what we're presenting tonight was a bench top test with jars and we're gonna that test has given us the green light to move forward to the next testing it's not uh, a green light to just un unleash the all valves and open the inner tie uh, but we'll get through that point and and give you explanations to why we don't want to go uh, to the whole district but it has given us the green light to skip over some additional correct lab testing right uh, uh, sitting next to me to my left is Emily Tummins with Black and Veatch and she's basically been with this uh, this test all along and so she's going to go through several of the detailed slides and can definitely answer any technical questions that anybody has. Also from Black and Veatch we have some other members of the team in the audience but on the screen right now I just want you to recognize that there have been an army behind this really working hard and collecting samples, providing review and input and just kind of shepherding this effort along it's it's not uh, something that happened very quickly um, so I wanted to acknowledge everyone shown here 
Um, to the right, Virginia Tech University has been uh, conducting all the lab uh, analysis, and you'll see a lot of their charts, and they're pretty well recognized uh, across the nation for being a corrosion expert. We'll get through there. Before we get into the results, I just wanted to kind of explain how this fits into our effort for supplemental supply. Um, quickly cover the community water plan that the district has um, embraced. Uh, first off, the community water plan wants to maximize conservation as well as groundwater management, but knowing that our existing supplies are not enough, we are pursuing other supplies. and. While there are four others listed there, uh, water reuse with pure water Soquel, uh, desalination and stormwater capture, this is one of those four that we are definitely pursuing and, and working towards. And we appreciate working with the city on this uh, to know what we can expect for the future. Um, quickly going through what the district, the board has adopted in our guiding principles specifically for surface water purchase from the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we've got four bullets here showing that we want to increase the public education and outreach uh, on this topic. There are two parts of this uh, effort. One on the pilot focusing on the north coast sources that the city uses as well as potentially uh, f additional water from the San Lorenzo River, which could provide a, uh, more supply f for us. Also, um, recognizing that currently we do have an agreement, and we'll look at it later in the slides, with the city to purchase this water over a five-year period. Uh, it has taken several years to get to this point, so we have not yet uh, purchased any water from them. Uh, Jointly, we've met with the state, and we realize that the district will have to amend the water supply permit, and so that's on our to-do list. Uh, completing this effort is definitely one step in the right direction to uh, ensuring the, the state that this is going to be okay. Our goal is to receive water um, in the winter of 2018. I put December there, but if we are ready, it could be sooner. If, if the city's ready as well, uh, there are certain conditions that need to be met before they are authorized to sell us water. Um, hopefully sometime this winter we can do that. And then also looking uh, forward, working with the city on how to best utilize conjunctive use and whether their efforts to do ASR as well as in lieu can, can be utilized. I'll skip over this pretty quickly, but uh, this is a clip from the executed uh, purchase agreement with the city, and I just want to point out that there are there's forethought into uh, maybe something into the future. This is not it doesn't just end here at the pilot level. Uh, both agencies had the intent of further exploring um, additional efforts after this. So for getting bearings. We've seen this slide before, but maybe some people in the audience have not. Uh, this shows the, the sources that we're talking about uh, available, and in fact, it's only two of the streams. They're not uh, large rivers. They are streams that are located off uh, Highway 1 up north. Uh, Lydell Creek and Majors Creek are the two that would be supplying water this winter if we were able to, to receive it. Uh, I think Laguna Creek is not part of the um, the group here. So we've spent several months looking at the compatibility of city water versus district water, um, recognizing that traditionally they are different water qualities, and uh, specifically when you make a change in one source to another, uh, it can have uh, unforeseen consequences, and so. These are some newspaper articles that you have seen before already in a previous uh, presentation, but recognizing that uh, there, ha there are examples um, with Fresno, with Flint, Michigan, with um, Davis and Woodland that have had issues with changing water supplies, so we didn't want to be on the headlines here. We want to have um, uh, cautious, take, take steps cautiously. 
Back in 2016, um, Black and Veatch started this with a, a desktop study looking at just the water quality parameters, but no water was actually blended together or, or analyzed. That did recommend a further study that could include an actual pipe loop testing. It, it recommended bench scale and maybe pipe loop testing. The city went forward in, in January of 2016 to uh, complete an environmental assessment of taking water from the north coast. So that's been completed. And we just finished the bench scale testing. And now the next step would be a continuing to a full scale pilot. And that can hopefully happen over the next couple winters. We anticipate that to be a roughly, we've calculated it to be roughly about 250 acre feet of, of demand in that area during uh, November and April period. So now it's time for Emily to go over the results. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. She's very familiar with the data. And then uh, I'll wrap up with the final slide. OK? All right, hopefully I'm loud enough for those not in the room. Um, so Taj did a really good job of providing the overview and a little bit of background. Um, so that'll be a really quick in this presentation. Um, I will describe the testing design as well as the summary of, of some of the high level results and then get to the conclusions and recommendations and then the steps that, that will precede this. So. Um, Jumping right into it. So we're, we looked at the water sources available both for the district and the city. Um, it is planned that the water will be delivered in the winter time. So the data that was analyzed was for the months of November to March for three years. Um, and the things that stood out were that the city feeds a corrosion inhibitor, orthophosphate, and the district does not. So that was one of the parameters we really wanted to focus on in this study, as well as the, the levels of hardness in the water and making sure that there wouldn't be any descaling in the district system um, if, if the city's water was introduced. So that's why I'm showing you a little bit of the background data. Before you go on, uh, there's one thing I noticed there. That Oops. Yes. It's the pH is talked about a lot in the document, and it's, it's typically talked about the 7.5 and the 7.2, but I see here the pH for the city is 7.4 as you've measured it, not the 7.2. So I'm wondering why, why is that discrepancy there? Um, Yes, we, we did look at, at some of the earlier months as well um, for, for part of the study, but the, the typical water appears to be 7.2 um, as what the, the city has. Um, this was so just a different time that you got it and it was a different pH. Thing. This, was, this was from 2012 through 15 when this data was, was analyzed for our earlier study. Okay. So, um, now, as well, you know, our water, we, we basically have one source of water, which is just the crown, ground. Yes. So of course, if you go different places in our district, it's different ground, so different water quality for that reason. Mm -hmm. In the city, they have very different sources of water depending on time. So in the winter, you'll get rainfall and runoff, and in the spring, you might get interflow and base flow that is contributing. In the summer, you may not use any of the, of the river water at all. Instead, you've gone up to the reservoir, and so there's that big change that's happening all the time. So uh, did you take account of that and, and adjust for it uh, appropriately? So this study just focused on the, the wintertime water qualities um, because that's what the proposed pilot is, is um, looking at accepting water during that time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there might be additional desktop an uh, analysis that that could look at at what what variations there could be there but since the water is all leaving the water the city's water treatment plant they um, the controls on the water quality the targets leaving the plant um, hopefully wouldn't vary too much I want to add something we did ask uh, whether the water quality changed and it does you're right um, but we wanted to be most conservative, and we, we did confirm that 
uh, or at least you guys did review the data and said that using the winter water would be more conservative because I guess the water coming out of the treatment plant on the off months of May through... Slight, could you talk slightly louder, Tom, please? Sure. Um, I'm trying, Tom, to explain that we did look at the water quality outside of the window of November to April, and we did find that it is it was the conservative approach to use the water during the um, to the time period that we sampled um, and so what you're looking at the data that is being presented to you is the most conservative uh, results so I'd like to follow up on that I like President Daniels seems like pH is key here because there are different results with different pH so does the city sample for pH frequently? And do we have the range of what it can be during the winter months? It is listed on the far yeah. right there. The average is uh, you know, shown at 7.4, but the range is 7.1 to 7.7. .7. And yes, they do that's for the That's for the entire year? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, 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 that's just for November the to period. March. Oh, from November to March. Yeah, so some of that might be. Uh, some other groundwater because I had a question about some other aspects of that chart that was the sulfates and then the surface area three seemed very close in chemistry to the to the city's water quality especially in terms of or the phosphate and well and pH too uh, I'm just curious about that where that where that water was located surface area three Aptos it's Aptos. it's east of Aptos Creek and Rio, basically Rio Del Mar Boulevard mm -hmm. on south. Um, the desktop study did um, uh, call that out that service area three water is more similar to the city of Santa Cruz water. There's naturally occurring phosphate in that water. Oh, but that's where it comes from. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So our distribution models showed that even running full bore, this would impact service areas one and two, but pr pretty much not at all service area three. So it's kind of even though it's the same, it's not even going to be impacted by this much. Uh, n another point about these, these ranges is that uh, it's not just uh, the season, it's also the weather. So this past year, we've, I think there were two months when there was essentially no rain. So even though it was the middle of the winter, it wasn't getting normal winter flows. It was getting instead you know, base flow and, and that kind of uh, behavior. So uh, you might actually get conditions that are outside that normal range, depending on what the weather's like that year. And that's why the state's going to require us to do, continue to do sampling in our distribution system right. throughout this pilot, right. uh, and even after that. Right. All right. So the goals of of the bench scale testing were to examine the relative aggressiveness of both the city's and the district's water, focusing on zone one, um, just so everyone's aware. Um, and then the purpose of bench scale testing really is to screen for multiple uh, treatment options that could uh, be implemented at that inner tie, whether it's adjusting the, the district's water throughout the entire district system or adjusting the city's water right as it comes into the district system. Um, and then uh, also trying to understand if there was a need for pipe loop testing for that extra step of demonstration testing. So as, as Taj men mentioned, the, the testing was all performed at Mark Edwards uh, Laboratory at Virginia Tech University. Um, and then we had metal pipe coupon testing, which I will explain in more detail um, throughout uh, this report. The wire testing is explained in the report um, that is provided. So for, for the coupon testing, these are um, small pieces of, of the pipes that were harvested from the district system. We selected galvanized iron service lines as well as asbestos cement pipe um, because they uh, have the highest potential for releasing metals and they're um, prevalent in the district system. And then there's also a copper pipe, new copper pipe with lead solder because co new copper has the highest potential for releasing um, metal. 
this is what the coupons look like, the harvested galvanized iron pipe coupons. We um, collected pipe from different locations and we saw that the first batch has that orangey iron scale. Um, the second batch had a little bit darker scale, which after scale analysis proved to be manganese, um, which is why it was one of the parameters that was looked at in more detail in our study to make sure that any um, changes to water chemistry wouldn't affect the scale currently present in the system. And this is just looking at those, um, the scale analysis data showing the, the iron was higher in, in pipe one and the manganese was, was the major um, uh, metal in the second batch of pipes that were collected. In total, um, a number of, of coupon jars were created with the different materials, galvanized iron pipe, cement, and then the copper pipe with lead solder. And this was all so that there could be a conditioning phase where we could then limit the number of, of pipe uh, coupons to the ones that release the most similar metals so that we had a baseline going forward for testing. Um, as I stated, the conditioning provides that baseline for testing. How this was performed was using the district's groundwater at a pH of 7.5. It's allowing the, the scale from those harvested coupons to re-equilibrate after being um, harvested and shipped across the country. The water was exchanged three times a week and this testing either lasted for three weeks or six weeks depending on the, the type of coupon so that um, we could measure metals and calcium, turbidity, and water quality parameters that would create our baseline. From this, we selected seven water treatment conditions to look at. The baseline groundwater at um, pH of 7.5 represents the district system, so that's our condition one. All of our results will be compared back to that as are they similar, better, or worse? Um, condition two looked at adding orthophosphate to the district's groundwater. Condition three represents the city's surface water at a pH of 7.2, which already contains orthophosphate in it. And then um, condition four looked at if the district wanted to adjust the, uh, the pH of the city's water at the inner tie to a pH of 7.8. Um, and that would still contain the orthophosphate. But really what we need to look at, as Taj already mentioned earlier, is um, the alternating conditions. Because if this water is only going to be used seasonally in the winter, maybe at first, um, we need to know what happens when you expose the, the system to one water for six months and then another water for six months or um, something of that, of that case. So really what we're looking at are conditions five, six, and seven where we're alternating compared back to the baseline. So when we look at the graphs, that's really what, what I'll try and focus on. Before we move on, does everyone understand these different conditions? Because they're referenced in the future and I want to make sure that's clear before Is we the move expectation on. that if the switching was faster, like one month yes and one month no, one month yes, that the conditions would be similar to the six months on, six months off uh, condition? Yes, we, we just try to, at the, at the bench scale level with coupons, represent that change in a shorter time fashion, but based on our previous work, as well as Virginia Tech's previous work, two to three work weeks is typically when you see um, if there's going to be a spike in metals release or water quality changes, mm -hmm. that's when it occurs. Okay. So. Same question I have. <laughs> Great minds think alike. So, oh. so it's been done with, you know, in terms of determining whether three weeks is, is enough time. Yes. For the alternate, okay. Yes. Just wanted to make clear, make that clear. Yeah, and there were, there were four weeks in between our testing, but three weeks is typically, two to three is what you need to see if, if there's going to be a spike. So then looking at the testing schedule, we had 13 weeks worth of testing. The alternating conditions switched um, after week five and after week nine. And um, 
just going forward so everyone's aware on what's what will be on the x-axis for the graphs if it says gw that's groundwater sw is the city's surface water and op means that there was 0.2 milligrams per liter of orthophosphate as phosphorus which is what the um would be present at the inner tie in the city's water and then the number is the ph So I have the results organized first with the asbestos cement, then the copper pipe with lead solder, and lastly, the galvanized iron pipe. We had controls as well for our testing. Um, the pipe coupons, as you saw in some of the earlier pictures, the outside was coated in an epoxy so that the water would only react with the scale on the inside of the pipe. Um, and so we wanted to ensure that the epoxy wasn't leaching out any metals or um, uh, modifying our water quality in any way. <coughs> so if it has controls, these were our, what our control jars look like. Conditioning values were prior, um, those three or six weeks. So the, um, the data for asbestos cement pipe, we wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be a problem with calcium changing from the water that we introduced to those jars and the water that was poured off two or three days later. And so what we're seeing here is that the control value and the, um, the jar value are very similar. Um, we're not really seeing much of a, of a difference. And so that shows that there's no concern for calcium scale dissociation. Um, the, the calcium level is not changing. Why is the spike in the groundwater at the start of those uh, sessions? Um, so the, the groundwater has variable levels of calcium, so it depended on when that water was collected from the, um, from the wells. And so we did track this throughout the study, and the calcium um, levels in the district system can vary from about 40 to, uh, I believe it's 110 um, milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. So... Um, there, it's just natural variability. Um, but it is good to see that even with that variation, we aren't seeing issues. So the city's water is much more consistent, um, calcium levels throughout. We also looked at uh, phosphorus. We wanted to make sure that the coupons wouldn't deplete the, the orthophosphate that's present in the water um, because we wanna make sure that that gets all the way the, to the customer's taps. And uh, again, we're seeing that the water that went in to the jars as the control is the same as what's um, coming out two or three days later when the water uh, was poured off to be tested. So we're really seeing minimal to no uptake of phosphorus for the asbestos cement pipe. Also, I should note that the, the, um, those pink bars uh, are and blue bars are representing when the water sources are alternating between surface water and groundwater. Um, so the way to read these is if the, for each of the conditions, say condition two, if the bars are all the same height, it means that there's not a, an effect from <laughs> being exposed to, to the pipe. Yes. Yeah, so, so if 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 the bar height goes up or down it means it's changing because of exchange with the pipe. Yes, when we're comparing the the control and and that week's um water quality, yes. Okay. Um and so here there's just very minimal changes. Obviously when the uh in the alternating conditions when it switched to groundwater that doesn't contain um orthophosphate, you see the, the very low levels of the detection limit, so that's why. So in summary, for the asbestos cement testing, we saw no concern for switching the sources. The, uh, like I mentioned, the calcium levels fluctuate naturally in the groundwater, as you saw by a few of those spikes. Um, surface water has a little bit lower calcium, um, but we saw no concern for scale dissociation and there was minimum uptake of, of phosphorus. So all good um, results for the asbestos cement testing. Now we'll look at the copper pipe with lead solder. 
And uh, um, this is the, the copper results that are being shown first. Um, when we're looking at uh, the weeks of testing, it's pretty minimal changes in copper, except for condition six. There is a little bit of spike when um, the water source is changed from surface water back to groundwater. Um, and that's the surface water at a pH of 7.8. And so this is um, the, the only concern that we saw in, in the copper results, um, even though it's minimal. But for the most part, the copper is pretty um, consistent throughout all of testing. And there's not an, an issue with the current um, groundwater. So that's what we're really always comparing back to, that condition one. Next, we'll look at the lead results. Um, we did see a decrease in lead for um, almost all the conditions. Um, <clears throat> for condition five, where that's the city's surface water at pH 7.2 with orthophosphate, when, um, when that water was in contact uh, with the coupons, we saw a decrease from the conditioning values that were exposed to groundwater. Then when we switched back to the current um, district's groundwater, we saw a little bit of an increase in, in lead, but it never got back to that conditioning value. And then when we switched back to the surface water again, we saw again the decrease. So switching to, um, to that condition, if, if that's what, what goes forward, that would represent a decrease in lead overall in the distribution system. Conversely, if you're looking at condition six, with the city surface water adjusted to a pH of 7.8, um, we did see a spike in lead when switching back to the groundwater. Uh, so those. So could you remind me what the MCL and public health goals are for? I can, but we shouldn't be looking at um, at at these results and saying, okay, we're going to see 40 micrograms per liter of lead in, in the system. Um, because these have been exposed to the coupons for longer than the stagnation time. I but see. but the, the action level for lead is 15 micrograms per liter. But these have been exposed to the coupons for three week, or three days prior to taking this water quality sample. So um, we can't relate it back to that. We just have to compare across the board um, to, to each of the coupons. Um, so the logic of that is that <laughs> the water, all different types of water are exposed at the same time, so it's the relative difference. Exactly, so yes, for the conditioning values, all of them had a very similar release of lead, copper, any of the metals we were testing. All of the coupons are the exact same size, surface area exposed to the same uh, volume of water for the same time. So we can compare across the board, but um, this, this level of testing is not representative of, of what you could see in the distribution system. Okay for concentrations, that is. But some of those issues yep. might be why we need to continue doing testing and monitoring going on forward. Right? Yes, and monitoring is recommended and will be required by the state as well. Because they won't be in contact for three days, they'll be months. Yes, but when you take a lead and copper sample, I think that's what you were asking, like the action level. That would be yeah. six hours of stagnation and then a sample, mm -hmm. so. We also looked at phosphorus, and similar to the asbestos cement pipe, the copper pipe with lead solder showed minimal to no uptake of phosphorus. Um, so, that so just going back to your point, yes. even though it's going to be in contact for three months, it's not the same water. Right. It's moving through the system, so it's, it's well. It depends. I mean, some vacation home, it might be in you know contact with the pipe for three months because it's not flowing in that pipe. Yes, that I mean that that could be a possibility, but we would definitely recommend that any property that has water sit that stagnant that they should flush that uh, water before drinking it for many reasons. But yes, well, these vacation homes, the people literally are not there for months at a time. So yes, mm -hmm. yes, but as soon as that water that is stagnant in those pipes is flushed out, then the fresh water um, wouldn't have been in contact with the lead or copper so but the point is that sometimes the flushing is they put a cup under the thing as soon as they arrive there after two months and proceed to drink it so yeah 
that, but that would be an issue whether you had surface water, sure. groundwater, sure. Sure. or sure. mixture. Right. Sure. Stagnant water. Right. water. I'm just making water. the point that the three day contact time that we're talking right. about here. Right, right. There are some situations where it's different. Water. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, so the summary for the lead and copper testing was that all the conditions decreased lead except for condition six, which had the um, pH of 7.8 for the city surface water. Conditions both five and seven were the other alternating conditions. They were equal to or better than that baseline for the, um, for the district's water. Um, both, we saw spikes in both copper and lead for condition six where we adjusted the city's uh, surface water to a pH of 7.8. Um, and so that, that switching condition created um, water quality issues. And then lastly, there was minimal to no uptake of phosphorus, which is typical due to the small surface area of our samples. So lastly, we'll move on to the galvanized iron testing. We looked at turbidity for, for these coupons. Um, the results were pretty similar across the board. If anything, condition five had the lowest turbidity, um, but st very, very consistent throughout all the weeks of testing, throughout alternating conditions. We looked at manganese because it was uh, present in the scale. We wanted to make sure that no changes would, would upset the manganese scale. And um, we saw a decrease in manganese for, for all the conditions. Um, so good results, even when um, alternating source waters. Definitely have scale, right. <laughs> and then uh, lastly, we looked at, at iron for the galvanized iron coupons. And again, iron is decreasing or um, very minimal changes, really, except for, for condition six there at the end when we switch back to source water at that higher pH of 7.8. Um, there was a little bit higher iron release. And then we did look at phosphorus, and here's where we do see that difference between what, uh, what phosphorus level was present when we put the water into the jars, and then three days later when the water quality was sampled. So that's where you see that the control bar is higher. Um, the phosphorus depletion was at anywhere from 15 to 67 percent after those three days of exposure, but throughout the weeks of testing, it did the depletion did decrease. And because of this, we wanted to um, look at the condition where water quality was sitting stagnant in pipes, similar to the, <coughs> the point you just brought up. And so we did a, a two-week oh. test where we took the galvanized iron coupons from that condition one, which is the baseline that has never been exposed to orthophosphate, as well as condition three, which is the city's water a pH 7.2 that has been exposed to orthophosphate for all 13 weeks of testing. We filled the jars um, with the city's water, pH 7.2 with orthophosphate, and um, then took samples every two to three days to test for the orthophosphate level. And what we saw was that the condition three coupons that had seen orthophosphate for all 13 weeks they saw a 60% depletion of orthophosphate throughout uh, two weeks. And the condition one, the baseline coupons that had never seen orthophosphate saw an 82% depletion, but they really do um, seem to reach a, a semi-steady state there. So um, it, it makes us confident that, that even if the water was sitting in, in long stretches of galvanized iron pipe in, in people's service lines, um, for extended periods of time that there would still be orthophosphate present um, when it reaches their premise plumbing. So this depletion is then the orth orthophosphate binding to the interior surface of the pipe or the, or the existing scale there or? Yes, what? both. So there's a lot of surface area for the scale that has built mm -hmm. up throughout the years. And so the orthophosphate is able to, to bind with the manganese and, and the other metals that are present in the scale um, and form this passivating layer on the inside of the pipe. And this is very typical, um, especially for galvanized iron pipe, that it, it has a larger demand for the phosphorus in the water. Um, and we, that's why we did this additional testing. 
and this I think wouldn't be considered beneficial because it means there'd be a protective layer built up of orthophosphate on the insides of the pipes over time. Is that not true? No, that, that would be beneficial. So yeah. it's, it's limiting the, <coughs> the release of, of the, the manganese that's present right. in the scale into, right. the, into the water. Okay, so, good. Yeah. So in summary, for the galvanized iron testing, we saw that there, the phosphate um, that was added to the water did decrease over time, but it was still present after two weeks of testing. Um, the manganese decreased, the iron decreased, uh, except for that condition six with a 7.8 pH for the um, city surface water. And then the turbidity was similar for all of the testing conditions. So in conclusion, um, Really, the, the alternating conditions are, are what we're going to focus on. So that condition five alternating between the city surface water at a pH of 7.2 and the current groundwater performed better or equal to the, um, the groundwater that's currently present in the distribution system for the district, um, highlighting the fact that it decreased both lead and iron. And the two alternating conditions, condition six, where that's looking at adjusting the, the city's pH to a, a higher pH of 7.8. It did not perform um, as expected. It actually showed some increases in lead, copper, and iron. And then last, yep. But you did indicate that that, it, it sometimes goes to 7.7, .7, which is almost 7.8. So we can expect to see some of those conditions from time to time. There, there could be a possibility of that, but also the city is looking at, um, uh, a, a treatment process that would be able to fine tune the, the pH leaving the plant as well. So. Okay, good. Um, and then lastly, condition seven was considering adding orthophosphate to the entire district system um, so that there wouldn't be that, that difference in that water quality parameter. It performs similar to condition five, but it would require addition, additional chemical feed systems, um, and it doesn't seem necessary at this point. So, um, so yeah, the recommendations are really to proceed with uh, condition five because of, of what's stated over there on the conclusions, and because of that, pipe loop testing um, is not recommended because we're not planning to adjust either the water chemistry, pH, or add orthophosphate. Um, but with, with looking at this full-scale pilot with condition five where the city surface water is, is being introduced, obviously monitoring is necessary, um, identifying um, or notifying the customers of any possible changes in water quality that they might see, and then flushing of the distribution system. So those are, are the next steps which are identified. So in terms of distribution system monitoring, um, it's already been brought up a few times at, at tonight's meeting, but understanding the water quality um, that's, that's currently present in this pilot area of the distribution system, creating that baseline, and then continuing to monitor when the city surface water is introduced, and then after in the summertime when it returns back to the district's groundwater. Looking at sampling locations in the distribution system, understanding that effect on the mains, um, lead and copper rule sampling sites will be required, and then disinfection byproduct sample sites um, as well. And this will be necessary to validate uh, the results of bench scale testing. So if, um if we proceed with this, we're going to have some kind of pH monitor on the lines, and if the pH is too high, we won't accept the water is from the city. I mean, what would you do to, to use the, the lower pH? I mean, that's what we're testing for, so you're assuming that's what it's going to be, or that we're not going to use water unless it meets that requirement. Am I yeah, that's that's a, a great question. Um, <laughs> uh, so I don't know what what monitoring is is available right there at the inner tie, um, but all of those were were the bench scale testing results. This will be the more of the full pilot scale full scale results, um, but uh, just making sure to monitor pH would be very important. Um, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
But I don't know. We have not set, uh, um, you know, how we'll respond if, if it does go out of that range. We'll work with the state on that to see exactly if they have a similar concern um, based on this result. I want to point out the last bullet there on the right, um, the state is requiring an additional uh, disinfection byproduct sample station, and they asked for it to be at the longest residence time in our in this test area that we'll cover at the end of the presentation um, but we should you know this test all the results that Emily just presented does do not analyze disinfection byproducts we didn't study that we did study that in the desktop uh, study and um, we are aware that it you know surface water does contain higher disinfection byproducts so it is on our radar it's on the state's radar um, we will keep you posted on how those pan out. What is the monitoring frequency that we're going to be looking at? I mean, we just have you know, before, during, and after, but during could be six months long, as we've talked about. So, in particular, with things going up and down, pH going up and down, perhaps other things going up and down. Um, Christine, um, I think what was proposed in the desktop study was. It's weekly monitoring throughout and one month prior and then continually during the transfer and then three months after. Okay. So the, these re are reassuring results that, you know, that there's not going to be a chemistry problem in terms of the metals. Um, but what our customers might notice is a difference in taste. Yes. So is that... I know that's not very scientific, but... It's the very next slide. Very mm -hmm. next slide, okay. <laughs> Before we go on, though, um, oh, yep. another thing. Um, it would be good to know where we are in this process. Um, you know, in, in theory, we would turn it on. Orthophosphate would go up because it's in the city's water and then stay up there and for six months. And then when we switch off the cities, it would go down. But, of course, in reality, it'll be perhaps going up and down and up and down because at some points the city may not be able to give us water for you know three weeks because there's you know not been enough rainfall during that time or whatever so it would also seem a good idea to monitor orthophosphate levels just to see where we are in terms of the mixing and uh, phosphate is part of the okay. proposed monitoring good. plan so um so the loop the loop tests that we're bypassing or not having to do that was a closed system without customers yes that would be again harvesting pipes from the system it'd be longer stretches of pipe um, that's really used to look at the hydraulic effects that uh, would be present and service lines or in premise plumbing where you have those eight ten hour stagnation times followed by flowing periods that's where you can get the more representative um, lead or copper levels that a customer might see um, but it, it in, again, is, is just, it's, it's a better representation, but um, it's often used for if, if you're going to um, optimize a, a chemical addition, if you're trying to fine tune what pH target you're trying to, to look at or, or what orthophosphate dose or maybe looking at a, a few different chemical options. So we, we have studies going on like that, but uh, it, it didn't appear to be necessary at this time because the, both the water chemistries appear to um, react uh, similarly when switching back and forth. You could do test that greater stagnation, like we, we get customers all the time who have not read any notices, who do not, they'll just, and we do have a high percentage of vacation homes that are, are empty for large, long periods of, of the year, particularly winter. And they might show up on a weekend for in the middle of winter. And I was just, I was just thinking of uh, if it's worth the precaution to design a loop test that adjusts for those kind of contingencies. I'm, I, I mean, there's, it's possible, but you're probably not going to loop test for three weeks stagnation time. Not. I have, uh, and none of, none of the studies I've been a part of, we've done that. It's, it's really looking at the eight to, to 12 hour stagnation times, trying to understand the, the hydraulics, whether or not the flowing water through the pipe is going to cause scale to, um, 
destabilize and you'll get particulate in your in your um, water quality. Mm -hmm. It's looking at, at things like that. But but all of those studies really are looking at adjusting pH or adding calcium to the water, adding orthophosphate, and that's not um, a recommendation of this study. So. True. For that, it's it's a lot of, of, of cost and, and about a year's worth of time to design, build, and do the extended period of testing um, that we just don't see as necessary at this at this point with, with the results that we got from bench scale testing. But. All right, so getting back to the customer notification, there there always is the possibility that um, with any change um, that there could be aesthetic effects that the customer could see, maybe a, a change in taste or um, a, a change in color and or odor. And so things of that should be um, notified to the customers just to alert them. Um, but we didn't see any of that from our testing. We looked at color. We didn't see any discoloration. We didn't see any spikes in turbidity. So we don't expect this, but it is still always uh, better to be prudent and proactive. Um, so. But you didn't taste the water. I did not taste the water. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but you, would you expect it to change, given we, these results? Because it's not. It's the mineral content isn't. Yeah, both both waters use use free chlorine. Um, the city has a slightly higher chlorine residual, um, but a, a residual of, of one milligram per liter is is typically not at the point where people are complaining of, of taste issues, um, from my experience. So, uh, but yeah, here was just a list of, of options okay. on how to notify the public and and things to be aware of and. As, as well as alerting businesses or susceptible individuals um, of possible water quality changes. And then lastly, it's the implementation plan. Um, and the, uh, the coordination that will be involved with the, the state um, Department of Drinking Water um, that has already been um, privy to, to some of this information, um, and then trying to understand what what uh, monitoring sites and locations they're going to require as part of this pilot study um, for the isolation area within the district system. And then just understanding the intertie logistics, working with the city, and um, this is the short-term plan with this isolated pilot zone. If everything goes well, then there would be long-term plans to open up the valves and um, allow the water to infiltrate a little bit further into the district system. And um, this pilot area has already been flushed, so that requirement is already checked off the list. Isn't this a kind of an extreme test, though? Because in, in the real operational system, we would let it flow to the rest of area one and even to area two. So in this case, uh, you know, with, with six months of, uh, of inflow, it's gonna be a lot higher concentration than it would be in the real system. So I mean, why are we doing it that way? Why not try and make it more like the real case? Right, the inner tie, I mean, if the, the inner tie can supply enough water, roughly 800 acre feet during that time period. So that would saturate sub areas one and two in that in the winter months. So, um, you know, we want to have at least some control over the test and so that we're not introducing other variables that we just can't explain. Um, the state division of drinking water was you know, supportive of this approach to take a stepwise analysis. Um, our estimate is that this first phase could could take in about 250 acre feet, um, but that's based on demand. It's the limiting factor is really the demand on that, not necessarily the supply. Right. Well, it could be supply. It could. <laughs> if we could if, end up getting if nothing. it's available every day, then then it would be demand driven. Particularly given the city starting with a dry condition, quote unquote, uh, 
that um, they made, I mean, just like last year, they didn't uh, spill the reservoir until like April or something, and then two days later they did a, a restriction, a tier one con restriction condition. Uh, so we don't know what's going to happen in that regard. So are you, these, so these, this testing was to done for was done for a transfer of city water to the district. Do the results apply to a transfer the other way if we're in a position at some point to give water back to the city? Well, the alternating conditions still would be the same. So it still is alternating between zone one, district's water, and so the, city's the, water. The same, so the pH, what we're transferring into would be would be key. Our, our pH is, is is relatively constant, I assume. Yeah, I guess the so one thing would be that we d we didn't test the scale in the in the city system. Um, like all all these, the harvested pipes were from the district system, gotcha. making sure that that scale was. So there might be different scales, so it might have a difference. You probably want to repeat this study with the uh, city pipes. Yeah. Well, maybe, but not necessarily. You know, the city does operate uh, at least in the western part of their district or the eastern part of their district um, they alternate already with the belts well field in the summer and then the city uh, the surface water in the winter so and they also have a basically a equal uh, um, equal equal baseline for orthophosphate in their pipes so I'm not sure if that's of course up to them to decide and at this stage we're our sources are not really uh, at any position in any stage or position to pr provide right, no, that I amount of that. water back to them. At I was just thinking down, down the line. So the last slide I want to cover, and it kind of is a map of this isolated zone for for your reference. Initially, we were trying to say west of Soquel Creek, but. Uh, because the, there are only two sources in that area, O'Neill and Garnet, uh, and they couldn't meet the, the peak production in the summer, we had to include Main Street well and also Pringle Tank. So that's why you see it uh, bleeding over into the uh, eastern side of Soquel Creek. But there are uh, roughly 2,300 services in this area. And um, I think we've covered all the other points here. Um, and maybe just reiterate that we're focusing on quality, not quantity, in, these, in this pilot program. Uh, what, as I mentioned earlier, the thing that worries me is that the three wells we do have in this area, two of them are currently down, one of them who knows how long it's going to take. The other one is just a, a physical process, which we've done before, so it's right. more predictable. I, I address that in the, board, in the memo, mm -hmm. saying that we uh, hopefully anticipate to have these wells uh, back online mm -hmm. um, in time to have the baseline tests for a, a month. I think there's base, baseline sampling for a month prior to opening the valve. So, you know, ideally we could get it done you know, ahead of time, but even still, it, it could, you know, maybe the, um, our goal this is this winter is to take some water. Mm -hmm. And that may shift if, if these wells are not online in time or maybe the ammonia returns and we, we do have to pursue the treatment. Um, we'll do our best to accommodate what we can. Any notion of, because um, we have lots of groundwater in the rest of our system, of putting in some one-way valves so that any groundwater that we don't have wells producing in this sub-area, we could just let in some groundwater from you know, the rest of Area 1 or Area 2 or wherever. If you had a one-way valve, you could just bleed it into the, uh, the zone here. Yeah, that isn't something that we've considered doing. Well, But thank you for the suggestion. We'll discuss it. Because that might, if, if we can't get those wells fixed, that would be the only way to do this test is to use groundwater from, because so, you definitely need the groundwater in the summer. Correct. The problem isn't the winter, because in the winter, hopefully, we'll be getting a lot of surface water from the city. So that might 
be enough with just garnet. But uh, yeah. you're right, in the summertime, if you want to keep this going a full year, and of course the other option is to not let it go a full year. Thank you for the input. Okay. Any other questions? Questions from the public? Right. Anyone in the public? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Thank you for the good presentation, and uh, thank you for getting this report out. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. What I'm not hearing anybody talk about is that last paragraph in staff recommendation, and maybe it's a typo. I'm, I'm wondering, um, the last, next to the last sentence, it would be unlikely that city water could be purchased before December 2019, a year? That's a typo. Good. Can you clarify then? Um, you are planning to take water December 2018. Well, if these sources that we just discussed are online. That is well, the hope and the intention, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, to initiate baseline sampling. Okay. And, and also a, rainfall, you know. And rainfall, you know, right. Early in the season, it's, it, it's based on last year, of course. It's yeah. really early in the season. Okay. Well, I'm feeling a whole lot better then because the 2019 date on there made it sound like you, we were going to have to wait another year. <coughs> and that was making absolutely no sense to me. Um, having already had to wait a year from the time you got the initial study before the bench test came. So thank you for clarifying that error. Um, I also want to say that there is a lot more water available. And, and as you said, um, Mr. DeFore, the, the inner tie is capable of supplying 800 acre feet. Is that the inner tie or is that the supply available from the creeks in a, in a good year? I cannot speak for the availability at the creeks, but that would be the availability at the inner tie. The inner tie. So that amount of water is available, as has been shown to you from the, um, the, the stream gauge data collection that Water for Santa Cruz County has presented. About three times the amount of water is available in, in wet years, certainly. And if, you, if the district is able to take up to 800 acre feet a year, why not take it? Um, because that's not what was analyzed in the environmental document. This, this focus is on the North Coast streams, and I think what yes. you're referring to is some of the stream gauges that were refer referred to for the San Lorenzo River, which is part of a, a longer-term phase that we will pursue, but at this time, that environmental review has not been done, and this is focused on the North Coast availability. I, I understand that. But the stream gauges for the North Coast streams do indicate, especially in very wet years, a lot more water than 320 or 250 could be taken. And I urge you to work with Santa Cruz City and accept all the water that you can. I guess my time's up. I, I, I also want to say that in the City of Santa Cruz's report, in recommendations, there was not this whole um, monitoring regime uh, talked about it. it was more on customer monitoring and even having um, you know households sample households and so that kind of goes away with the clarification of the date but thank you very much for the report anyone else seeing no one um, when we talk about availability there's different kinds of availability there's physical av availability if you go down there with a bucket you might be able to get who knows how much but there is a uh, practical availability. And currently, the agreement we have with the city limits it to 300 acre feet. And the environmental analysis that was behind that is also predicated on 300 acre feet. So if we even consider changing that, it would have to go through the whole process again. And who knows whether that would work well or not. But that's, that's the practical availability now, it's 300 acre feet. And that's assuming, you know, the weather cooperates and it actually f is physically available. But 
So those two constraints are on top of each other. Okay. Um, so any other further questions? Okay. We were asked to approve this uh, final report, accept it. I'll move to accept it. Second. A motion second. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Still there, Tom, huh? <laughs> yes. Director Christensen? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> yes. And President Daniel? Yes. Thank you for coming, and we appreciate your hard work on this. This is an important project for us. Um, okay, item 6.3, discussion of the elements to include in the finance plan and impacts of financial assumptions. So, um, as you all know, we are in the midst of a um, development of a finance plan and a water rate study with Ralph Tellus. And um, we've discovered as we're developing the finance plan that our, there are some complexities that we'd like to seek some board input on before we go too much further. Um, one of those complexities is the timing of a finance plan and rate study. I know the board had directed us to look at a five-year study, um, but as we looked out over those five years, we were seeing that the timelines for um, our supplemental supply development and the timelines for the rate study were, were overlapping a little bit. And so that raised some questions about which costs to include in a finance plan. Um, I know the board hasn't made a decision on a supplemental supply project yet, so that introduces some questions about what we should include in a finance plan and what type of scenarios we're going to run. So what I'd like to ask for input on tonight is whether we have Raftelis run various scenarios, what you would like those scenarios maybe to be. I presented three possible scenarios for you this evening. Um, and if we run different scenarios, what considerations would you like us to include in those scenarios? And whether you still want to look at a five-year rate study or if you want to consider a possibly shorter rate study period. So a question. So is there not enough information available to... Um, to do scenarios with with desal and with an enhanced water transfer, I have in, I have included costs in a finance plan for the 300 acre feet transfer that was presented this evening, and for continuing to look at stormwater recharge projects. But those are smaller portfolio projects; they're not a supplemental supply large project. So I don't have any forecasted costs on desal, and I don't think the desal project timeline would overlay the three to five years that we're talking about now, because as I understand it, they're still in an EIR phase on that particular project. So I don't think we would be looking at design and construction of pipelines within the three to five years of the rate study we're looking at now. Um, because we, we ourselves would have to go out, presumably, for EIRs and for a lot of feasibility studies before so we So likewise, with an enhanced water transfer, we don't have the information. Yeah, there would be a lot of feasibility studies we'd have to go through before we got to a design and construction phase. Now, on the Pure Water SoCal project, that one has gotten up to a point where it could possibly overlap this rate study period. And so my question is, do you want those costs included? Do you want a scenario run that includes those costs? Um, how would you like me to structure this finance plan? Well, he w the question he was asking is, is it too hard to include the pure water in rate studies? I, can we? Now, the pure water, no, because we have defined costs on that plan. I don't on the I don't on the D cell and I don't on the enhanced. But you're water saying transfer. those wouldn't, wouldn't appear in the five-year horizon anyway. Right, those wouldn't appear in the five-year horizon. So the anyway. difference between three-year and five-year is how much of the pure water, if we were go, going forward with that, would be in the rate study. Correct. 
Right. We have traditionally done a three-year. I think the board recommended a five-year this time. I think the advantage of a five-year at this point would be it would probably cover all of the projected rates for that period were for the project period from design through presumably construction of a plant. So you would get an idea of what those potential rates could be. Um, if you did a three-year, you'd only be covering a portion of, of such a project. Um, if you did a one-year, we'd be going out for Prop 218 annually, and you'd have the associated costs of another finance plan and rate study and Prop 218 notification, which are costly in and of themselves. Can I add one thing? Just because I think this does um, contribute to the and and or discussion related to supplemental water supply. So I think what we're, um, what Leslie is Sorry. Sorry, this one kind of gets really back feed, but maybe it's better. Um, this, what I want to just add in terms of the and or or is where we need to try to build a finance plan that best captures what we're doing with supplemental water supply. So all of the efforts that we're doing right now with uh, Brown and Caldwell to do delivery models is basically projecting out a project based on design and construction every year that then would feed into the finance plan and lay out the impacts on rate. If what we're, n what we're not doing or maybe we would like some discussion on is the and part of it and I think that Director Jaffe asked the question related to an expanded river water project. Um, at this point, we're kind of thinking it's a little speculative because the city's timeline is not until 2020 will they make that decision of then going forward with environmental review, design, and permitting. So there is a, a potential that some of the tail, tail end of the five years would need to include that if you wanted to, to add that. Or we could just qua quantify that as supplemental water supply as a project and not define it, right? Okay. But it would, it would. That would be overlapping projects, though. You'd have to, 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 to honestly and accurately assume that you were doing both projects, you would need to add that quantification, that monetary amount into your finance plan. And the, the certainty of the information, seeing as the city hasn't um, determined which way they're going yet, would be low. I mean, that's. With all these longer term plans, that's always an issue. The farther you get away from going to the future, the less certainty you have on on what's going to happen. But that's true as well of Pure Water because we don't know whether we're going to get any grants or lots of grants or some grants. or So there's a lot that, of uncertainty. That's, there. that's actually a scenario we can look at. Yeah. There's yeah. more certainty in that. Can I? Can I, yeah. I, I? That's why I was wondering if we couldn't you know, make up five-year plan with the with the worst case scenario but then kind of include in that plan what would happen if we did get the grant what would happen if we decided not to do the project for whatever reason I think that's her scenarios and two and three then pure water with no grants and pure water with grants All right so yeah right. that makes sense Tom um, so Including the these different scenarios, how much of an effort is it? And well, then if we were to run all three scenarios, each scenario has kind of its own considerations. Um, if we were to run a no project scenario over the next five years, what what would it look like if we weren't doing a project? Would we need to reduce our demand projections because we would need to um, reduce our our pumping? and increase our costs for right. in other areas like conservation or you know i mean i i there's a lot of assumptions a lot a lot of a lot of considerations would go into building that that no uh, no project scenario yeah do you do you include what happens if there's seawater intrusion what happens if you have to do a moratorium i mean or even rationing cases? Um, would we change our would we change our bid our, our our billing system then accordingly if we were doing a, a rationing to a water budget type system would we mm -hmm. what type of conservation expenses might me might we need to plan for what reduced demand we'd have a zero growth we wouldn't bring in any water capacity or water demand fees presumably then so it's 
it all kind of ties together. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of asking for the board's input on, on some direction um, that you'd like me to include in those three scenarios if I pursue those three scenarios. Personally, I think scenario one is this disaster scenario. And I don't think we should, and we haven't really talked about it much. And I think spending a lot of time to discuss what is it and what could it be and what might it be is, is really not worthwhile. I would do scenarios two and three. So that would I, let us I agree. That would let us know the Start best and the worst. Scenario one, it could, it right. could, like, you could go on forever. Yep. I think we're better off spending our time trying to make something real happen. May I add, because um, it has been brought up by Director Jaffe at one of our earlier, like, uh, community water plan workshops that we had in the room next door, and it was also something that uh, Director LaHue had asked us during the desal project was, what is the cost? What does it cost a ratepayer uh, if we don't do a project versus if we do a project? And the scenario one is is the that no project where we w it is a very worst case. Uh, instead of selling, you know, right now our water demand is at about 3,800 acre feet per year. We don't sell that much, but we're producing about 3,800 acre feet a year. If we don't get a project, we have in terms of the guiding principles, I think, set that we would reduce water demand greatly, like just hovering over 2,300 acre feet. So s I guess creating a finance plan based on water sales that are drastically reduced does show an impact on a customer's bill, an impact on rates that we would we would have to in, in incur if there was no project. So from an outreach and education standpoint, that was kind of where that no project plan would be if, if we don't do that, we, we may want to try and figure out how we craft that, if that's still of interest. Well, I'd make the point that it's unrealistic. We would never do the no project. We would do something. We wouldn't just sit here and watch the salt water pour in. We would do something, it'd probably be something drastic, and I don't know what it would be, but, and it would have costs, and it wouldn't be cheap, and so. I, I, I'm wondering um, if, but it, Tom? So just, as I recall, when we looked at this years ago, the, the customers end up paying as much for water, they just get less water. That is how the, this this when we analyzed it before. That is how this baseline, I think, was set up by you, Leslie, where you would... Yeah, I mean, that, it, it's not predetermined, but uh, Director LeHue is absolutely correct. It was, you, you have to use less, but you pay about the same with a, a curtailment uh, scenario, you were, you were rationed. I'm wondering if we can't get this into two ways, and I look to Leslie. Um, one, I hear the idea of running scenario two and three, but maybe some need in the, for outreach to somehow get a feel for scenario one, but we wouldn't have to do it a, a, um, in, in their most rigorous mode or official manner, but we could give some perspective to if there was, you know, we would come up, we'd use some numbers from previous uh, curtailment efforts because we have to rate, uh, ratchet up that curtailment effort and ratchet down water use and run it in a simple way that would maybe yield some some um requests from the board yeah requests from the board education for for the customers do you think that's possible and then then run scenario two and three more rigorously um it's difficult for me to know what okay. the implications of scenario one would be what is it five six years later well, well, we'd have to discuss was, that among five staff. It was five or six years I'd ago I'd that we last ran that analysis, right. I think, and things have changed drastically. So it would be a little difficult for me to project what scenario one would look like without actually running those numbers. Right. If we gave you what the uh, delta for, for additional effort to, to ration, basically, or water budgets, if we could come up with a number that we felt that was accurate and comfortable. Maybe what we should ask is... is Oh, could I, could m maybe, and I think this is something that staff had, ta had talked about, there's a difference between kind of creating the, the finance plan or pro forma looking outward with different projects and then creating a, a rate off of a finance plan. Could, could, could we do the finance plan and the rate study or the rate building off scenario two and scenario three, but develop kind of a, a, a finance plan 
with the baseline that would show, you know, like how you did in the pro forma, percentages of rape increases that may occur, but you're not going into the whole rape study on top of that scenario, that may still provide that, that information that was requested. We'd, we'd have to pull together the costs that we would put into that scenario. And like I said, those costs were five or six years old at this point, at least. Um, that was what, 2014, I think, when we looked at a full toolbox approach? 2012. 2012. Yeah, 2012. So we'd have, to f we'd have to have some method to accurately update okay. those projections. And then I think we could run some numbers. Um, but if we were to focus in on scenarios two and three, um, Scenario two would take into account the entire project, which I assume we would, for planning purposes, be fully debt funded. We'd go out for borrowing on the full cost of the project. Okay. And, and, and Leslie, does that assume, though, that we would uh, uh, get SRF or we would be at that level? Well, that I, I th there's, a, there's a limit okay. to what we can do in terms of SRF or WIFIA funding. Okay. Um, so we would have to couple that with traditional bond financing. So there'd be we would. tiered borrowing levels, I think, in Kay. that type of scenario. Um, I did talk to the uh, to Lydia Gutierrez, our, our grant consultant, and she recommended if we were to do a scenario that included grants, that we just include the Prop 1 um, planning grant and the Prop 1 implementation grant because the Title 16 grant costs are less certain, and she said there's a timing differential there where sometimes it's 10 years later before you actually see a cash flow from that, which would necessitate in, in the scope of the finance plan to borrow and then use proceeds later down the road to reimburse. And the Prop 1 is much bigger than the other one anyway, so you're getting much of the benefit already. Okay. And more certain, I'd say. Um, now, the other question is if we are to go ahead and run a scenario that shows um, a project over the next five years, uh -huh. do we look at deferring any other of our CIP proposed projects to accommodate that scenario? What are the projects? Well, um, one of the big ones I know that we have next year is Quail Run Tank. Um, that one's a six million dollar project just right off the top of my head. I know that one, but there are main replacement projects. There are, there's the Cunison Well project and all of those I think are within this five year window. You know, and as we, as we talk about this, I'm wondering if it wouldn't make sense. That's a big, that's a big uh, question <laughs> without knowing exactly what we're talking about, I think. Um, would it make sense Leslie, in this scenario, to, to ask if a board member or two might like to work with us on that smoothing process or that uh, that you're talking about, I mean, to get some input there, or yeah. I'm actually asking the board there, but you also, if you think that's necessary, or if we go back and uh, try to smooth it out to make it as most comfortable for the customer, I think is what you're, you're, what you're aiming for. Yeah, the, um, the challenge we run into a little bit is the timing. We don't have another board meeting until August 21st. Yeah, it's, it's mid-August. And that's actually when Raftelis um, needs to be able to present the finance plan and some preliminary rate development off of that. I think so Ron was talking about one or two board members working with you. Not yeah, the there would be there would be some work that would need to take place between now and the final presentation in August. Um, or or an another method, just that. to throw out options, I, I'm not, I hope I'm not stepping on you, is, you know, just ask staff to come back and list those assumptions when we um, come back with the model. Hey, we delayed this or we, we moved this CIP project or uh, I know um, there's other there's other things in there we might be able to reduce and we could we could you know state be explicit about that some of it you haven't even seen yet because this is forecasting this is out of 20 uh, year plan yeah kind of yeah thing. so um yeah and there's uncertainty in that but yeah. as long as the assumptions are listed i'm i'm good with that i think the other option which is much simpler is just to say you know some x percentage of the things that we would do in th three we would not do in two seven say st 25% of the things in three wouldn't be in two. And we could we wouldn't identify those. exactly which ones, yeah. but we would reduce that spending yeah. by 25%. Yeah, that's, like a, that. that's an okay. interesting 
then because often we do that ourselves you know mid-year plans we realize we have to reduce and we set some kind of percentage and we yeah. we reduce to meet that percentage okay well, I, I certainly think it's prudent to look at two and three I if there's a way to to do one without going you know all the way down the path of of getting rates just to have a kind of a sense but I agree it's we're gonna have to do something so okay it it might not be worthwhile doing one okay well we might be able to to flesh out a, a rough estimate in-house on a scenario one type thing and have the rate consultant called consultants focus on scenarios two and three that's what makes sense to me okay we'll see if we can achieve I, I, it I would like to see both two and three and I'd like to see rates two or at least or at least the ballpark percentage of what the difference would be or something between two and three yeah yeah and are we talked about one being something in-house just kind of more informational to you know the no project which is not realistic but just kind of to to come up with with some some rough numbers on that to see how it compares i think the major th comparison that our customers are going to want to see is the difference between what they're paying now and what they would be paying in either in two or in three in the future then the other question would be do we want to stay with the five-year finance plan and rate study I think so I think that's 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 when the project will be actual actualized if we're lucky right 2023 so that would bridge that and I think you already said that we could just break it off and do a rates a rate study earlier if it you know had drastically changing conditions so we right could. go stop we and go, go back out reason. yeah for that that was the reason i thought five years for myself uh, and in terms of effort to do a five-year versus a three-year <laughs> not much difference so no. it's no. just we'll have to put the filter on it that years four and five are less certain okay mm -hmm. okay great you need a motion or have you got what you need I'm I think I, I think there were motions included in there I'm trying to pull up my uh, by motion provide direction on which scenarios I should pursue or have ref tell us pursue and then direct me on the coverage period well I'll make a motion we look at scenarios okay. two and three and we go out five years I'll second it um, second director yes. public comment. yep public comment sorry about that <coughs> Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner of Aptos. Um, I just want to point out that scenario one is not really no project. It, it would include the um, North Coast water transfers, which could be more than 320 if, if there were a, as aggressive action being taken for that as there is for the Pure Water SoCal project, and also um, aggressive action to get um, more to get water from the San Lorenzo River to pursue change in water uh, water rights I also want to point out that um, in the 2017 feasibility um, report it it said that the cost of pure water SoCal at that time with without Santa Cruz being part of it would be 183 million that includes I assume the interest because at that time the district was saying the project would cost between seven, 60 and 70 million and now more recently your consultants have told you to expect the project to cost more between 90 million and 135 million so 183 million isn't even enough and I also heard that even if you get the grants as it was said tonight um, you can't count on that money up front it may take even up to 10 years for that one um, title 14 like a title 16 <laughs> um, thing so 
Um, the Prop 1, that's a $50 million grant? Is that how much that one is? Up to. Up to. So you're looking at a huge bill on your customers that have already just gone through a 17% increase, and many of them already are not able to afford their water bills. And um, I think um, a lot of this is getting the, the cart before the horse because you don't have the research in to verify the holding times for this water being treated water being injected into the aquifer. That's huge. And it will affect the other people around your area, the people with private wells. So um, I understand you're trying to figure the financing of this out, but it, se it seems to me incredibly expensive. And your mantra of safe, affordable, timely solutions is not being upheld because this will not be affordable for a lot of your customers. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'll just say that in terms of this long-term transfer or even transfer back solution, uh, Watsock had some incredible numbers in it. We don't have any data from the city as to how much of that money they want us to pay. They certainly aren't going to give us the water for free, and we don't have any idea what the cost would be. So, yes, that might happen, and yes, we're doing the groundwork to see that, you know, that might eventually happen, but you can't plan for that right now because we don't have any numbers. Nor do we have any dates. And I'll, I'd like to also add, just because they're not here, I think Santa Cruz is moving. Uh, you know, here that 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 effort's not going fast enough, and I think they are moving as according to their community water. Its community water plan had recommended, and they're on track. So I think they are being as as aggressive as they can, and, and mm -hmm. we've been working with them as as you know as much as it makes sense. Okay. Well, my motion still stands. What I had is. I had the second, I guess. My second still stands. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody Would else you? has a second. You can have it, Tom. So the, the one thing that's missing from that is kind of an in-house analysis with the, with the option one, just yeah, to okay. get ballpark. Yeah, okay. Would you be willing to, to explore, for us to explore yeah. that? Right. Yeah. We'll add that. To the level that, you know, staff thinks is. is Worth through, a while, yeah. Worth a while, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. Item 6.4, service area 3 to 4, inner time. Well, it's, it's time to review bids. We've received three bids for this project, and we also have another project that will be presented to you in, in the next month or so. Um, but we're excited to have received three bids. Um, unfortunately, the bids came from a, a contractor named uh, California Trenchless Incorporated, the Don Chapin Company, as, and then as well as Pacific Underground Construction. Um, the district has had experience working with the, the second and third bidder. Um, and I wanted to point out, and I apologize for the board memos, um, uh, non-traditional approach to how we award uh, bids, but um, in this case, we wanted to have a discussion here at the board. In fact, um, the second uh, lowest bidder is here in the audience. Don Chapin, as well as uh, Greg Reynolds, is here to um, to ask the board to consider their bid. Um, the low bidder, the apparent low bidder, uh, failed to include three addendas that were set out during the bid period. Um, and after the bid opening, we did contact the, um, the second or the lowest bidder, California Trenchless, and asked them if they received the addenda. They indicated they did not. Um, and we pointed out that we did email them the addendas. We posted them on our website and um, we did fax them to them. After that, they said, well, send us the addendums, and they acknowledged all three of the addendums and indicated they would not uh, increase their bid. They would do the project at the price they bid, uh, honoring the three addendums. So we then um, 
looked at the contract documents and, and the memo does clarify all the different sections of the contract documents that really clarify that these are supposed to be submitted at the time of the bid and whether that is something that the, the board can waive as a, an irregularity or not. Um, to be able to provide the board a choice here, we did include the second lowest bidder, Don Chapin Company, to be considered. And, and in preparation for this memo, uh, I didn't have all the information at the time. There is a, a, a variance that needs to be considered also for Don Chapin. Um, in, in our contract documents, we stipulate that the general contractor, which is the Don Chapin Company, or the low bidder, California Trench List, need to have a certain amount of qualifications to work on this project. Both, uh, m both contractors have met that qualification. Then it comes down to we also having a certification for the subcontractor. This job does require uh, subsurface boring, uh, uh, horizontal directional drilling, and we listed the requirements for that. And specifically, they needed to have performed uh, $1 million in the last five years um, pulling PVC pipe 1,000 lineal feet or more of the same diameter pipe. We just basically wanted to make sure we have the subcontractor that's familiar with this type of project. Um, earlier this week, we did review the bidders, the subcontractors' qualifications for the lowest, second lowest bidder, Don Chapin's subcontractor, and they do not meet those requirements. Um, however, they do demonstrate, you know, familiarity with horizontal directional drilling. Um, they have instead bundled other pipes together for solar bids and pulled a bundle of smaller pipes through. Um, so they're, they're trying to, um, you know, plead their case that they do have the experience even though it's not specific to the 12 inch diameter pipe. So unfortunately we have two bidders that don't fully meet all the requirements of the bid documents. Um, I am going to let uh, Mr. Don Chapin speak to you and, and let him plead his case and then we can have a discussion after that. Okay. Excuse me, but Todd, you and I have discussed this. You might want to mention the subcontractor on the lowest bidder. The, right, that's correct. Um, the lowest bidder had listed a subcontractor that uh, had no trouble meeting the requirements that we, sp we specified. In fact, they are JC General Engineering uh, Incorporated, and they uh, were the ones that completed the Trans, um, Trans Bay Tunnel Pipeline. So they have, that was a 7,000 foot, 14-inch uh, PVC pole. So uh, they're a very large horizontal directional drilling subcontractor that didn't break a sweat meeting these qualifications. Uh, bear in mind, the district will be working directly with the general contractor, not the subcontractor. So, um, and I think that might be uh, a point that Mr. Chapin will make to, to us is that you know, it's his neck on the line, not the subcontractors. So that's another thing that I want to say that, you know, the general contractors both did meet their qualifications for submitting a bid as far as experience goes. And who was the <laughs> subcontractor? Who, oh, which one? For Don Chapin. Oh, it was um, Hardcore Construction. They're based out of uh, Northeast Sacramento area. So I'm gonna let Don approach the board and talk about your case. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Board members, thank you very much for the time. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come to you tonight and uh, chat with you just a little bit about this project. I do have some handouts. Uh, would you like me to hand them to you or? How many would you like? Four up there to the dais? Well, I don't, 
And here's a couple over here. When there is no way we're going to read these. No, we're just so going to point out a couple. Of I don't want one. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and essentially, I'm here tonight. Uh, we have a long we have a long history. Obviously, the John Chaper Company and Soquel Creek has done uh, uh, a number of projects together over the 42 years that I've been in business, and we've had an excellent uh, history. This particular job is not a large job. I want to say this job was in the three quarter million dollar range. And uh, it does have a, a qual uh, one particular um, piece in it that is a horizontal directional drill, and it goes uh, under some under some fairly large trees. Is essentially what this does. It's a little over 600 feet of horizontal drilling, and it pulls back a 12-inch pipe. The 12-inch pipe would be on the other side. The bore would go through, hook it onto the pipe, and pull the pipe back through, and then we connect the two ends. It's a pretty simple process. Um, that's really the, the question about, about qualifications. The question about the bid is uh, uh, generally an entity that receives, a, receives bids would, uh, would open the bids and determine who the apparent low bidder is and then do some checking on the apparent low bidder to make sure that his bid was appropriate. When this bid was open, it was noted that the form was re that was required in the bid uh, was not there and that the low bidder did not uh, fill out his documents uh, correctly. In the s set of documents that I've given you, you'll notice there are a few, a few things, a few pages in. Uh, I've highlighted them. Uh, one of them that's important for you to note is, is bid modifications, and your specification does not allow any bid modification after the time that the bids are received. In this particular case, this bidder did not fill out his addendums. The addendums are material. Uh, they're fairly substantial in nature, what they consist of. They certainly don't make the bid any less. They would add uh, expense to the bid, so it's important that they be recognized. And in this particular case, uh, the modifications should not be allowed. In this particular case, when that bid is analyzed, that bid should be rejected because it is not, does not conform to your specifications and uh, is not what would be considered a responsive bid. Then you'd go on to the next bidder, which in this case would be Mr. Chapin. Uh, Mr. Chapin's bid is responsive in, in every uh, material aspect, with one exception, and that is that Hardcore Drilling, who is a, a drilling subcontract, has been in business for about 30 years. They're not large, they're small. He does a lot of boring work for us. He doesn't uh, have major experience, but he's experienced enough that that I, as a contractor who's responsible for the job, felt comfortable with him. He was not the low bidder on this job. Like I indicated to Taj, we received three bids for uh, bore, boring subcontractors, and we chose uh, Drew because we had a relationship with him. We knew who he was. He's a, a few thousand dollars more, but again, uh, I'm the guy with the insurance. I'm the guy with the bond. I'm the guy that at the end of the day you look at to make sure it's done correctly, and I am the responsible one. Uh, I'm not sure why the requirement was in there. Uh, it really shouldn't matter to Soquel Creek who does the bore as long as the bore is done per specification and is completed per the plans and specifications. And I have every reason to believe that our subcontractor would do that. And as I indicated to, to Taj, what's the worst thing that would happen, Taj? And it would be that something happened. He couldn't complete the bore. And who would you look at? You'd look at me. And you tell me, Mr. Chapin, fix that, because that's what you get paid to do, and we have a contract for that. So I believe that the requirement for that subcontractor uh, to have uh, three projects, a million dollars in nature, all of a 1,000 feet of pulling plastic pipe 12 inches or larger is a requirement that is very waivable, uh, knowing that the general contractor is a responsible party the subcontractor doesn't even get acknowledged on the project. So so we're here hoping that you will um, honor our request, and that is to look at the first bidder, determine his bid is not responsive, cannot be modified, reject that bid, and award the bid to a contractor that can complete the work and waive the minor irregularity that uh, that I believe is, is, is very waivable in this case, knowing that it's uh, the general contractor that has the burden on this particular job. So we'd love to do the work for you. Uh, we, bid, we bid jobs all day long. We've been doing it for 42 years. I can't even tell you how many 
thousands and thousands and thousands of projects that we bid. The bidding process is fairly um, important to us and the integrity of the bidding process is fairly important to us and we take it very seriously. I can assure you that I have a, a person that works for me that this is all they do is make sure our bid documents are correct and she chases me around the office when the addendums come in to make sure that I know what they are and to make sure that I sign for them and I did in this case uh, three different times. So uh, that's that's my request of your consideration tonight. I appreciate that. I'd like to have a conversation, answer some questions if that's possible and, and uh, if you would so indulge. Any director questions? How much, how much experience do they have and what's the longest length and the type of pipe? You know, Taj got the information. I didn't, I wasn't privy to the exact information he sent Taj. They, uh, they've been doing this for 32 years. We've been working with them for probably the past uh, 15 or so because trenchless technology really didn't get going until about 15 years ago. They've got experience pulling uh, uh, 18 inch pipe uh, this is a 12-inch pipe. They've also got experience with large bores pulling bundles. You heard uh, Taj indicate bundles uh, of, I think, up to eight uh, four-inch pipe through one particular bore. The bore had to be about uh, 24 inches in diameter. So it's this is a matter of, of uh, running through a boring machine, uh, and it's directional. It has uh, uh, the tip on the end of the boring rig is actually able to, you can move it and manipulate it to go wherever you want running it through, connecting onto whatever you're gonna bring back and then bring it back. So what you're bringing back is not what's important. What's important is to get the, the bore correct from a horizontal and vertical alignment perspective. That's really the trick to the bore. It's really not in whether you're bringing a two inch or a 12 inch pipe. The pipe doesn't know how big it is, only the boring machine does. I can answer some of the experience uh, submitted um, for you. It was a little difficult because they, um, he listed, uh, in this case, 6,000 total feet um, uh, combined, I think, over multiple poles with 500 feet of a bundle. Uh, another one they did 750 feet of 18-inch steel casing. Uh, there were nine sites that totaled 4,500 feet of boring where they did a, a bundle of four-inch HDPE high density polyethylene with six uh, six four inch pipes in a bundle for 4,500 feet. I think that was nine separate poles, and he didn't break that down specifically per pole. Uh, then there was um, 15 sites where they did 11,000 feet of pulling with five bundle uh, a bundle of five six inch pipes. He didn't say how far the pits were, or no, those were no. It's 11,000 feet. You don't do one. Well, that was 15 poles. Yeah. So I don't know the range. You know, the range and lengths there were not specific. Um, <coughs> and th this isn't a cased one, right? It's just one. Correct. No, it's not. No, it'll be the the actual PVC pipe will just lay in the ground. Well, this is a, a fused pipe. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, PVC fused pipe. So the pipe gets fused above ground, tested before it gets pulled into the uh, into the excavation and the driller uh, opens the earth, fills it full of a substance to keep the earth open and then pulls the pipe back through. And as the pipe comes back through, the substance comes back with it that holds the excavation open. We vacuum that out and that's how the pipe takes up that space in the, in the earth. So the pipe would be all fused on top of the ground and is actually fused by a separate subcontractor, not even uh, done by this boring particular uh, individual. So the, maybe we should clarify, the limited scope of the subcontractor that you're looking at on the screen would be um, drilling the hole and pulling the fused PVC pipe through. The rest of it would rely on the uh, general as well as other subs to do the fusing. It's three days of work. Did they give you references? Um, the answer, I think, is yes. Yes, is, yes. they did, um, and so did the the other bidder, and they came back favorably. Um, I have to admit that I was unable to confirm that we've checked these the references for your sub. I I, I don't believe we've had a moment to do that. 
but again, our our contract would be with the general um, contractor. Anything else? Yeah. Can, I have well, a quick question. I, I, I just how what is involved with the addenda? Like, what are those uh, yeah. tasks? They're in your packet from the board packet. Yeah. And they're in our packet. And I think it's I, Taj. Is it correct that the other bidder did not know the cost? I mean, the the other bids before he agreed or they agreed to the agenda the Th low bidder that is correct um, we made sure that the the changes so addenda are changes to the contract sometimes they um, make the contract less of a contract sometimes they add work in this case all three addendas are adding work in our opinion um, one of the addendas addendum one um, basically cl clarifies uh, the tie-in to the existing pipes. Um, it clarifies the, the weight of the pressure reducing vault that they have to bring out, that the general contractor needs to hire a crane to bring out to offload the, the PRV. Just we wanted to be clear that in this instance, the district purchased, pre-purchased these long lead time items and we did not want the general or the bidders to assume that we would be offloading it. So that was one um, clarification that they need to hire their own equipment to offload it. Um, there was uh, access clarifications for, for traffic control. Um, also, there were questions, and I, I do believe you may want to clarify, Mr. Chapin, that your company did ask predominantly a lot of these questions that are contained in the addendums and their clarification questions um, at the uh, pre-bid meeting that was not mandatory but uh, we did clarify the backfill for the pipeline uh, not at, not dirt this project is a combination between the drilling and then open trenching um, and so we clarified that the the trench backfill outside of the drilling needed to be a certain depth and w of a certain backfill material. Um, be and then also the insurance clarification of, of 5 million and 10 million for the general and aggregate. The third addendum O oh, discusses the, the temporary access on the farmland, it is organic farmland, so there are some um, real particular requirements for that, uh, maintaining uh, deer outside of this farm and, and also clarifying how much room is available for the general to set up in. Um. So I can point out a couple other things if, if the board would like. Does that answer your questions, uh, Director Lincoln, on the addendum. Our, our car uh, let, <laughs> let me let me just read one more thing on, on the top of every addendum it says you know this addendum forms a part of the bidding documents and will be incorporated into the contract documents insofar as the specifications or drawings or both are inconsistent this addendum governs acknowledge receipt of the addendum by filling out the addendum receipt table provided in document section 000300 the bid form failure to do so will be subject to subject bid to qual disqualification so m you know that is pretty clear in the addendum and it is clear in the uh, contract documents however the board does reserve the right to waive any irregularities at your discretion Yeah, so I'll, I'll Sorry, he's gonna ask. Okay. I'll, I'll add a few extra words that may help um, set the frame it. So the district does reserve the right to reject any bids. That's your, that's your right. And it also um, awards will be made, if any, which in the judgment of the district is in the best interest of the district. So what we have here to sum it up is a, a local contractor that does good work, well known, uh, with another uh, firm from, from out of town, but uh, both have I irregularities which the board can consider, waive, reject, accept, uh, and, uh, but what we also have is one bidder 
is approximately $57,000 lower than the other bidder, both with the irregularities in their bid. Any other questions of staff or? I was, no? I was gonna ask council what is considered to be, um, what was the word? Material. Material. I think they both are. I mean, that's why I think the board has the right to waive irregularities. And so we can pick either one we want then? Yeah. Or, or even, I suppose, we could disqualify both of them. Don't they both if have disqualified? You, you retain the right to reject all bids. Yes. Okay. Someone uh, from but California but recognize, Tosh is probably about ready to tell you, we just acquired this easement. The project needs to be done I know. this summer. Yes. The next bid is the next bid is nine hundred is nine hundred thirty three thousand. The lowest bid was nine six ninety five, and Mr. Chapin's bid was uh, seven fifty three. Is there somebody here from? I California do Trenches? not believe there is a representative from California Trenches tonight. I'm not. They were informed that we were. This was an item agenda. Yes. Okay, when the public wishes to address us on this item. Jesus. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner. Let me clarify, is this following the railroad track? It is outside of the railroad right of way. How far? It's parallel to the right of the railroad right of way, but it is not within the right of way. Have the soils in the project area been tested for contamination? No, but it is an organic farm. That's true, but these are historic railroad soils. In the Aptos Village project area, when the Trout Gulch intersection was done, those soils were tested and were so contaminated they had to be hauled to the Altamont site. There was as a result, um, almost $800,000 more expense added to the project that had not been considered before. So I think it behooves you, especially because this is organic farmland, that um, the district first test soils throughout the project area to determine any possible contamination levels and that any contractor that you hire to do the work be certified to handle hazardous materials. Not all of them are, but this will be imperative for this project, especially because it crosses organic farmland. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, back to the board. I'll take a quick stab. I mean, I'm I am troubled with the uh, the lack of an of addressing the addenda. They d do seem substantial to me. They aren't like a a major addition to the cost of the project, but it's quite conceivable that it could bring the cost of the project closer to the second bid. And uh, so I'm troubled by that. That it's amorphous. See, and I'm troubled by. The, the lack, lack of, of, of documenting experience. I mean, that's a th to me that's much that's a material issue because we want somebody that has experience and they document it. And I don't understand how it could be that hard to do. If you have the experience, then that's great. And if you don't, then you don't. Um, the addendums were little details that, if they're willing to not, you know, to stand by their bid and not ask for change orders for those, that's really their problem. I suppose, except that, I don't know, sometimes that's not how a project really works out. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't know, I'd have to defer, and I'd have to defer on the experience. I mean, to me, this is a, an engineer's bailiwick. I don't have the ability to judge that. I'm just going on just the lack of attention demonstrated, I guess. Well, since we have a single engineer on the board. Mm -hmm. She's completed quite a few trenchless projects <laughs> in her career. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's really important to have the experience because um, it, it can be just a nightmare. I mean, what would happen if it, if it failed is that they'd have to dig out, you know, dig down and do something with the pipe. And that's, very that's the whole reason you're doing it trenchless is so that you don't have to do that. Um, you know, it's possible that they're just fine, you know, bundling it or putting in, but the different kinds of casing have different issues and the different sizes and the type of pipe and what's, you know, the length of the PVC and as it's being fused and brought down. PVC is not as flexible as HDPE, so you know, for me, the experience, and I actually, I think California Trenchels did some jobs for me when I worked for the county. So, I mean, they're, they're um, qualified, just like Don is, you know, as a general contractor, done a lot of projects. I'm not happy that they're not here, but. <laughs> Do you have Tom, Bruce, do you have anything to add? I'm going to defer to people with more experience than me on this. Me too. Is that a comment, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I do sometimes think, uh, you know, the engineering department has a lot of experience working with people. My main concern is that it gets done in a quality way in a reasonable amount of time and we don't end up having to deal with other omissions. I, I worry a little bit about that. Or bellops. So you're saying the fact they didn't see the addendum might be an indicator that they're not going to um, pay attention to other things? Just an atten attention to detail yeah. worry. That's just, a, that's just mine too. I don't have a way of evaluating that except that when I was reviewing bids that mattered because yeah, I'd heard that, oh, it's fine, we'll get that done, we'll put it in there. Well, they mm. have to initial it. Mm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm re reassured this is much more mm. of a confined contract, but that still doesn't leave you off the hook on nightmares that could happen because something fouled up. So what's the worst foul up? The horizontal trenching going not right or why 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 have you required that we feel that that is while um is there a creek or a drainage that it's going under or it's, well, it's going right, under it trees. trees yeah eucalyptus yeah. trees uh it's very close to the bluff uh, of the coast yeah but you know we do feel and i know mr chapin may have downplayed the uh, effort to do this horizontal directional drill. It is not something that we do as a district very frequently. We've done it before, not not nearly this long. Um, you know, certainly the pipelines identified in the Pure Water Soquel EIR involve a little bit bigger pipeline uh, installations with this technology. Um, but so that's why is that we don't have a ton of experience. We want to make sure someone is brought to the table with experience. Um, and the place, I mean, open trench, how deep is it? It's not. The open trenching is deep. It, uh, I think six feet of cover is the minimum required because they do ripping in the fields. And so it is a deep open cut, not, not like sewer deep. I know for, for you that might not feel, seem very deep, but, um, nothing that's probably out of the realm of so the, most the, of the, the two low bidders. So the trickiest part of the project will be the trenchless part? In our opinion, yes. Well, as, as for me, uh, when I read the staff report, I was thinking, you know, yes, indeed, the lack of attention to detail by the first bidder, the lowest bidder, uh, was a killer for me. But now I know that there's a lack of detail on both of them. Right. And uh, so I, I would go with what uh, Michelle has I to know, say. I mean, if, if there wasn't the issue with the experience on the second, I would say yes. You know, the, let's go with the second. But I'd, um, I'd go with the first bidder myself. 
I really apologize for not having both sides of the story in the memo. It was a, it was a Thursday, 2 p.m. Yeah, bid. You're, you're excused. And, and so we <laughs> a few other things on your plate. We, we had to get it wrapped that. up, and and we didn't have time to check that. I really apologize. No problem. Make a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the bid from the parent low bidder, California Tarantulas. Okay, and I think there'd have to be a motion to waive the irregularity of not submitting the addenda. So it'd be motions two, four, and six. Yeah, and okay. I think two might need to be uh, include um, in in motion two and uh, waive the irregularity of of the bid okay. for not submitting okay. the addenda. Well, I'll second that. Track of the motions. <laughs> okay, it's here we are. Okay, I will move that. I'll second. Okay. Roll call. Yes. Director Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. I guess so. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. And President Daniels. Yes. Okay, I just want to clarify for the record that you've made a motion to waive the irregularity of California trench list for not submitting the addenda. Um, and you're finding them the lowest responsive responsible bidder. You are also uh, uh, adopting motion four, which is a resolution 1821 to award the contract to California trench list, and then also authorizing general manager to issue a PO to California trench list. Okay, yes. thank you. All right, fun. Okay, where are we now? Five, I think. Six, Six five. five, yes. Six point five. Um, this is an item to evaluate renewal of the intertie agreement with pure source water. Since 2007, the district has had a one way emergency intertie with pure source. Um, they are considered a very small community water system with 77 customers and a population of uh, about 203. Most of their services are unmetered and they bill on a flat rate. After the intertie was first installed, renewal of the initial agreement was subject to the district's review of Pure Source's efforts to increase redundancy in its system. Um, then in 2012, the board asked that Pure Source submit a plan for metering for the 2014 agreement renewal. A plan was submitted and the board reviewed progress for that. Uh, metering implementation in 2016. Um, so last time we came to the board in 2016, uh, Pure Source outlaid, outlaid their goals for um, their updated metering plan. Their goals were to complete the state revolving fund loan application, um, receive funding, and then apply to the C uh, California Pub Public Utilities Commission for another rate increase to pay back the loan and then install all the meters in 2017. Um, their progress to date on those goals, they have submitted three more of the uh, SRF supplementary applications. They're now working on the engineers, engineers report and they've physically located and inventoried most of their service lines that will be required for meter installation. Um, and Martin Mills is here today to um, answer any questions you might have. Um, there is attachment four includes um, a copy of uh, the agreement that the it's the same as it was two years ago, um, which uh, has a renewal in 2020 uh, based upon review of their metering plan. Um, do you have any questions? Any questions? I, uh, I was, did you get grant money for your metering, your meeting, metering um, process, I guess you'd call it? We looked into grant funding uh, and we're told that it was not available because we're not a disadvantaged community. Really? And then the other question I had was, do you know how much, uh, can you estimate how much your ca customers use? Um, you know, with their daily usages, like the. We do estimate that based on our total production. 
Um, we've not really tried very hard to estimate the the loss of water due to potential leaks or anything like that. But based on just dividing the total production by the total number of estimated customers, um, yes, we do have approximately 85, something like that off the top of my head, um, gallons per capita day. Um, I might add that that's an overestimation of the actual consumption. Um, our, uh, the district's water loss is about 8 point six percent as based on the last numbers we've had so um, I'm not sure the, the, the state of uh, pure sources system but it could be much higher than that so say if it's 20 percent lost than that their consumption would be 20 percent lost than that number I, th I think it's likely that our loss is higher than yours um, just based on our um, poorly assembled <laughs> water main that we've discovered in the past we've had some issues with um, we also are estimating our, our number of customers based on a survey that we sent out. We did have pretty good feedback. Um, you know, we just basically asked how many people live in your house. Um, and quite a few people did provide that, you know, about 50% or so probably. Um, but I think it's probably, if it were, <laughs> if we were to estimate whether we're high or low, I think we probably have more people in the houses that did not provide that information because people don't really want to say, and um, you know, sometimes you have illegal rentals and things like that, and those are not usually the retired customer that's just the couple that's been there for 30 years in that house. So have you ever explored uh, like assistance, state assistance to convert to upgrade the system so that you could tie in and become um, district custo customers? Have you ever, has that been done or discussed in the last? Um, we've discussed it internally just uh, and with, you know, people we know who uh, work with, well, we're, we're a member of the California Water Association, which mm -hmm. uh, works with lots of different uh, water systems like ours and larger that are just privately owned. Uh -huh. um, it's it's challenging. It's complicated to do that. There's a lot a lot involved. A lot of politics involved. We're not opposed to the idea necessarily conceptually, and um, we certainly feel the pressure from the state. I think, and um, you know, the entities that be don't believe that water systems of our size are viable. Um, sounds sounds really <laughs> iffy right now. <laughs> I mean, kind of. I would say you were disadvantaged in the sense that you're struggling. Yeah, our system, um, it, it struggles because of the number of customers we have to, to spread the, the issues out onto. For example, you know, we, if we have a repair that costs $5,000 and then we have to divide that only by 77 houses, it gets, you know, it's a lot more than if we had hundreds or things like that. Um, you know, I know we, we talk with Trout Gulch Mutual Water quite a bit and their folks and we share information in Central as well. Um, but, you know, by comparison, uh, you know, Trout Gulch is two and a half times our size, you know, which definitely makes a big difference. You know, they're looking at $4 million projects and, you know, we're trying to figure out how to come up with 80,000. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's part of the issue with our, uh, our grant application, or our not grant, our SRF loan application is that we were advised to um, include our basic main needs that we had that we could identify all into one application. So we actually have four different items. Um, all of them are at least, well, mostly somewhat related to this in the sense that one of them is providing power to the inner tie, um, which right currently it's operated by a propane power generator, which we discovered when we use it extensively doesn't work very well. Um, and another one is putting in a new well. So that would obviously change our, our ability to produce water. Um, and then also um, the, the metering, of course. And then the last one is doing some uh, rehabilitation on one of our water tanks. That won't change anything about our storage or anything like that. But because we bundled all this together, it's, it's a significant project. Um, I don't know for sure if I would do it again that way, but um, that was what we were advised to do, and that means that the, the technical documents that we're now preparing 
for this process are a lot more significant, a lot more complicated. Did you get help with doing the technical part? I know that they have support for that. Um, yes and no. We we are working with the state, um, and we have met with them, and they they were not real. Um, they offered help, but more in the terms of that they're going to take on the the EIR part, the environmental portion of the application. Um, so in that sense, that's great. But as far as um, you know, the technical documentation, the um, the construction documents themselves and, and things like that, they, they don't provide the help for that. Um, I'm a civil engineer, and so our plan has been to have my civil engineering firm provide that service for us, um, and the difficulty has just been having time to do that <laughs> in w given all the uh, projects that we've had to deal with with the water system. Any other questions? I'm looking at the 2007 agreement, and there were restrictions on what could be done and what couldn't be done during emergencies. Yes, and those restrictions have carried through through all the other agreements as well. So that's on this agreement as well? Yes. And I'd just like to point out that, um, you know, those restrictions, to, in my mind, are a very significant part of this. I mean, I think we should remember that in this renewal, of this agreement that um, we first of all have to have an emergency where we can't provide enough water for our own customers. Second of all, we have to ask for permission to activate the inner tie, which of course you you may or may not choose to do. I think it's the um, you know more the staff level that makes that decision. Um, but we do have those significant restrictions on the usage when we're using it. So um, when we did actually do that, we had you know signs up posted. We notified our customers, um, MailChimp, and uh, actually bill inserts and sets like that, reminding them that you know constantly that we're under severe restrictions, much more than just the drought restrictions. Um, and then also just that this is not something we frequently do. I mean, we uh, our last renewal agreement with you was in August of 2016. At that point, we were actually using the intertie and and stopped using it at the end of well, the beginning of September of that year and haven't used it since. Um, and a big reason for that is because um, of the cost. I mean, it's it's very expensive for us to run it, not only in terms of purchasing the water from you, but also in terms of having to, you know, fill the propane tanks on the generator, go up there and turn it on, turn it off twice a day because we can't run it at night, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's it's not a good solution for us and it's something we never want to use. It's always a priority of ours to not use this inner tie. Um, you know, when, when we were using it for an extensive period of time, we just, we couldn't pay our staff to pay salaries. I mean, I, we just didn't cash our paychecks. Um, so it's, it's not something we take lightly. It's, it's our high priority to, to not ever use this inner tie again. <laughs> no offense, but um, we definitely appreciate having been able to use it, but it's not uh, financially feasible for us to use this for significant periods of time. Any other questions? Public comment, maybe? Right. Public. Public comment on this? Becky Steinbrunner, I'm a customer of Pure, Pure Source. And I just want to tell you that as a customer representing the community, we are incredibly grateful to have Martin and his wife Jennifer running the company. They do an excellent job. This, this system comes with a long, sordid history. If you know the name John Kavanaugh, <laughs> you know what that means because this system was put in illegally by John Kavanaugh when he wanted to develop the Rio Del Mar Lodge sites. He got a grant from the state to upgrade the system. He acted as his own contractor. He was not a contractor. He used improper pipe. He used in improper installation. And uh, there was no county oversight. So that's the system that Martin and Jennifer have to deal with. And they are incredible stewards. They do not live 
any longer in the area. So they come from the San Lorenzo Valley to turn on and off the propane when they have to use the inner tie. We don't want to use the inner tie either. And to answer your question about maybe a consolidation, it was discussed when things were so bad under the Kavanaugh's that we were without water for days and days and days. And at that time, the district was going to require so much money up front to completely up um, upgrade the system. Our community, which I guess is not considered disadvantaged, but boy, we sure all struggle up there, we could not afford it. And we discussed as a community the option of being a mutual or a county service area or some other system. And at that time, we were very lucky because county council stepped in and said, you're going to sell that system for a dollar to Michael Mills, Martin's dad, because these people need and deserve a good system. In terms of the intertie connection now, what it affords is fire protection for your customers too. Because if we don't have the water to fight the fires as they come from the summit area, from um, Trout Gulch, Larson, Nicene Mark State Park, where there are many, many um, illegal campers and homeless, your customers will also be threatened and you will also have to spend a lot of money for firefighting water. So I appreciate that you are considering this and I hope that you will renew it again and know that Martin and Jennifer are doing an incredible job. The issue of installing meters is not a simple one. Because of the history, people hated John Kavanaugh so much, they covered their service connections with concrete and hid them. So it's not an easy thing to even find them and okay. there are no maps of the Thank system. You. Thank you. Okay. Anybody Back to else? the board. Yep, anyone else? Well, I think that uh, being a good neighbor is important. And to me, the fact there are restrictions on this make, makes me feel comfortable that the pure source will be good stewards of any water that they get. So I'll make the motion. And I'll second it. Well, on discussion, I, I have to admit, I'm, I mean, clearly this is a system that's uh, on a shoestring, and the shoestring is horribly frayed, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a good situation. In fact, it's interesting the state has now put together this program to take all these little barely working agencies and merge them into other agencies that around them that are bigger and more able to handle this. So I think that's what needs to happen here, because I mean, if you look at for the production, in fact, interestingly enough, between 2016 and 2017, their usage went up 16%. So whereas we have been working really hard to reduce it, you know, that's why we put meters on every one, that's why we, you know, even we, we even put meters on, you know, apartment buildings when they get built. And um, I, I think it's just kind of irresponsible. I've always commented on the fact that it's wrong for an agency, small little agency like this, to rely on us for redundancy. And we put a lot of redundancy, we have a lot of you know, extra wells and tanks and everything because we know it's important to keep the water flowing all the time. And for a little agency to you know, basically have us spend for redundancy so they don't have to, I think is just wrong. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't think I can support this. Else? Okay, roll call please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Tom? Director LaHue? Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I just didn't hear my name. I was waiting. Um, and I also think that um, despite their difficult situation, I think we still need to provide support. So I will say yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? No. Okay, we move on to, that passes. Uh, let's see, we move on to 6-6. Six, six. 
Yes, yeah, so Aqua's fall conference is coming up again the end of November the 27th through the 30th in San Diego. Uh, I believe Karen has um, set out the preliminary agenda on the desk, which was not available at the time we, we wrote the memo. Um, so what we're looking for is uh, by motion authorized attendance to the, to the Aqua fall conference. And uh, if you do that also, um, as soon as possible, let uh, Tracy and me know that uh, you intend on attending so we can start getting the arrangements made. Um, I'm not, not able to attend, but I see the value in this, so I'll, I'll make the motion. Okay. I'll second. Roll call, please. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Daniels? Yes. And I will be going because I'm in the groundwater committee, if nothing else. I think it's Thank pretty you. useful for us. Thank you for doing that. And I'm considering going as well, but I need to see if I can get off work. Okay. Thank you. And I, in particular, need to go down Tuesday. And okay. the groundwater committee meets at 10 a.m. And it's always been I have to go Monday night. Okay. Yeah, make yeah, that you work. Go Monday. And it would be good for those who are going to see if we can share rides to and from the various airports and so forth, uh, so. Absolutely, and, and just down. for uh, in case it um, changes, you know, whether you're gonna go or not, the other board members, we will be setting up meetings as we have done in the past with the Bureau of Reclamation and Federal Fish and Wildlife, so. Can you uh, speak a little louder, please? Yeah, as in the past, we will be having meetings with the uh, Bureau of Reclamation regarding our grants and also with the feds on uh, uh, fish and wildlife. We meet face to face with them each time. Does the state come down for those meetings? No, they don't usually send people down. I haven't uh, seen that. That's okay. a good question. Yeah. There may be a, a person or two uh, from there that we could talk with. Okay. Okay, six, seven, I think is the next. Statement of investment policy. Yeah, so item 6.7 is to approve our um, investment policy. We're statutorily required to present this to you annually. Um, so this is for fiscal year 1819. There are no material changes over last year's policy. Um, I will make the motion to approve. Oh, wait. Anyone in the public wish to talk about this? Yeah. Hmm. Seeing no one, I make the motion to approve. <laughs> and I'll second. Beat you. Roll call, please. That's <laughs> <laughs> mean. Director Lather? <laughs> yes. Director LaHue? I am mean. <laughs> yes. Director Jaffe? <laughs> yes. Director Christensen? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. 6.8, overview of the potential health effects of RF exposure. Hello. So um, I'll be doing this one for Shelly and I'll keep it brief. Um, at the last board meeting, staff presented a proposal to update the district's current automated meter reading or AMR drive-by meter reading system to advanced metering infrastructure or AMI. And an AMI system transmits uh, the consumption reads automatically to a base station receiver several times a day without the need for an employee to drive by. These are sometimes referred to as smart meters. Um, they're widely used for um, electricity metering. Um, both type of the metering systems, the AMR and the AMI use radio frequency waves to transmit the reads to either a district vehicle or a base station. And this is the same type of radiation used by microwaves, cell phones, um, Wi-Fi, baby monitors, walkie-talkies, um, a lot of consumer devices. However, there is some concern from some members of the public about human exposure to radio frequency waves, so we wanted to take a look at that, and the board asked us to, to bring this item back. Um, we did look to large organizations like the World Health Organization, the Federal Communication Commission, the FDA, um, and major health groups like the American Cancer Society for their statements regarding radio frequency waves and smart meters. The common conclusion from these agencies was that the RF exposure from smart meters like AMI um, is very unlikely to be a danger to public health. And they gave a couple major reasons for that. One is that 
this type of um, radio frequency wave is considered non-ionizing radiation, which doesn't have the energy to directly damage DNA like um, other types of radiation like x-rays or gamma rays. Uh, also, the limited amount of transmission time from a smart meter, uh, these meters are supposed to only transmit a read twice a day, and um, each read is supposed to be under a second. So it's a very short amount of time. And um, a customer's distance from the meter, you know, our meters are located outside, normally at the street. So uh, the, the um, danger of these meters would be a lot less than um, cell phones or Wi-Fi routers, things that people you know, have a lot closer um, to them in their homes. So the, the rest of our research is laid out in this memo. Um, this is just an informational item, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? No. Any comments from the public? I, I would much like to thank, thank the staff for putting that together who are worried and so just thanks for that yes thank you good work it was easy to read too yeah i'd like to thank you the references that you could check just uh, right at your fingertips you left one off i noticed the the international agency for research on cancer uh released a monograph in 2013 though that was pretty uh it's pretty definitive at this point in terms of an of if anybody in the public is interested in the actual ex what exposure people are talking about when they talk about cancer, it is not at the level of the AMI uh, metering systems, but it does really delineate, describe all of the uh, potential sc uh, exposure scenarios that are could be very informative to people who are concerned about that. Well, the thing I find compelling about this change is that if AMR is an issue, AMI is a thousand times less because of the simple timing difference. Um, so if you're concerned about it, then we should definitely do the changeover. <coughs> Any public comment? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Thank you for um, addressing this issue. I really appreciate it, and to the board for um, asking for follow-up based on public concern. I'm sorry that Marilyn Garrett couldn't get here tonight. She would, um, she would have a lot to say. I will just point out that having the, the devices at the street doesn't make them any safer for people like me who have to go through a canyon full of them. And while I understand that it's uh, less frequent a signal being put out is still a signal, and the um, the result the impacts are cumulative. That has to really be examined carefully in our society, and and is by some societies in other parts of the world. But while they may not cause genetic damage like X-rays, they do cause disruption in the blood-brain barrier and cause, especially for the young, whose, whose skulls are thin, they, they do cause brain disruptions. And it is a concern for me. Um, so I see that you're gonna go through with this, but I just do wanna register a protest as one who appreciates living out where there is no cell phone service by choice. I live there because of that. Um, to now have to go through, um, and, and I apparently I have already been going through the canyon where there's a lot of this um, radio frequency. And, I, and again, I, I would hope that you consider the cumulative effects of this on, on members of society and give people the opportunity to opt out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Back to the board. I don't think there's an action. Only. Is it? Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh. Information only. Time right. to move on to 
6.9 surplus property sale. Yes, this item is um, to approve the declaration of surplus items with resale and direct bids to be solicited from the public for their purchase. Um, for this surplus uh, sale, we have identified some candidates uh, to pick up trucks that have been replaced. Um, some uh, and various other like compaction rammers, a concrete saw, a valve operator trailer, uh, and, and a rainwater harvesting system, and then various cubicle parts. Um. Public comment, sir. Sure. Public comment on this item. Seeing none. Back to the board. I'll make the motion. I have. I have. Well, okay. We have to get a second now. Yeah. I'll second. Okay, on discussion, I had a suggestion. Uh, item seven there, the rainwater harvesting system, $2,700. Um, that's gonna be pretty expensive for anyone to come up with. And I was wondering about breaking it when there are three 1,100, or 1100 gallon tanks and you could sell those separately and those might well sell. Whereas the whole package, um, and, Maybe someone would buy it, but it's, it's less likely, I would think. So. Um, that is a, an idea. The idea was just to sell it all together because it, it came, came as a with unit. The yes. one pump for all three tanks and one diverter, so it's, it's kind of an all. Well, I suggest if you want to do that, let's try it that way. And if that doesn't work, then you could re-send re it okay. out as if pieces. Okay, if we don't get Because the tanks bits. by themselves might be yeah. doable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, roll call. Director Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. President Daniel. Yes. There is no written communication, and I think we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.